When Death Will This Meet, Part 1 Written by Andrew's Second Account Did it resist? The captain asked. It's a male, and as you already guessed, it's sentient, so no, he didn't resist, replied the ship's veterinarian, a shalkoth named Ginter from Vree. Captain Anticton rolled his eyes. He forgave the woman for her poor attitude. Her race of graceful, two-armed, four-legged undulates were a law-abiding sort of people. They could never be comfortable in the exotic animal and slave trade even when their job was only to keep the merchandise alive and in good health. It was fortuitous then that she didn't have much of a choice, being merchandise herself. That wasn't to say that she was for sale, only that she wouldn't be for sale until the better veterinarian came along. A tiny whelp like that, he wouldn't have stood much chance. He must be smarter than he looks, the captain said with a chuckle. Be grateful to it. Since you don't need to patch it up, you can have the rest of the day to yourself unless something comes up. The short fur on her back, brown laced with white, lowered a bit. He wasn't used to seeing her without her hackles up all the time. He wondered if it meant that he was going soft. He'd have to extend her hours tomorrow to make up for it. There is something you should know about him, she added before turning to leave, her tone brighter than normal. He seems like a nice young man, but I think he could have done more harm than you suspect. And he resisted. He's heavily muscled, much more so than even a high grab world would require. And he's a carnivore. That gave the captain pause. Carnivorous species were a rarity in the universe, and sentient ones were even rarer still. In fact, he couldn't think of a single intelligent species that routinely chose to eat the flesh of other creatures. Except for one. Glancing to the deck plates beneath his broad hooves, he thought immediately of the lithe predator lurking in its cells in the bowels of his vessel. A night beast from a Glass Eleven death world, its sentience was highly debatable. Captain Anticton ran his thick tongue over his blunt teeth. He didn't think this hairless whelp was anything like that at all. That is not possible, he said. Our newest guest, uh, what did he call himself? Human, said the vet. Named Stee, then. The human has herbivore teeth. I don't see how he could possibly be a carnivore. Of course, he did not display his teeth much. But when he did, I noticed a set of fangs. Very, very small. Almost like the rest of his teeth. But there, she pointed to a space between her incisor and molars. Two on top and two at the bottom. Little fangs. Really? He didn't believe her. What else? Don't tell me you didn't notice the way it stares. It's two eyes. How do they make you feel? Deeply, instinctively fearful. Creeped out might be a better word. The thing was tiny, chest high, but... And when I was trying to figure out what to feed it, the ginter continued. I was shocked to discover that fully one half of the rations in its craft by calorie content were comprised of animal protein. She looked sick. He could sympathize. It was one thing to talk about eating flesh in an academic sense, but to actually have seen an animal's carcass dressed for consumption up close... Disgusting. Point taken, he said. I'll be careful around it. That meant that he'd be armed and wouldn't hesitate to shoot it. Novelties like a new species were worth money. But not that much. Not enough to risk his life. He might even just get it for fun. Every time he went on vacation, he spent more money than the creature was probably worth on more pointless and less satisfying pursuits. There is another thing to be wary of, said Antignon, thinking aloud. If he has the significant amount of musculature he doesn't need, he might be some kind of super soldier, engineered to be that way. Maybe, said the bat. There is no way for me to confirm or refute that, but it is certainly a possibility. So, we have a carnivorous super soldier locked in a bunk, not even a cell, let alone a reinforced cell. Uh, that's just fucking great. 
Add to that the night beast caged in the bilge, and it's a wonder why we're all aren't dead ten times over already. Well, in fairness, Stephen seems really nice, said the vet. Davy, make them fight, chuckled the ship's executive officer. He had walked in to begin his shift while the captain and Ginter had been speaking. He smiled. Maybe. End of chapter. Night beasts, night stalkers, night terrors, the people of the night. Putting one in the same room as anyone, even a possible super soldier, meant sentencing him or her to die. Those nocturnal hunters were the stuff of nightmares and horror vids. Purely carnivorous. They could eat plant matter like any normal race, but would become blind, start to wither away, and eventually die off without flesh to supplement it. They were small compared to most beings, but incredibly strong and moved faster than the eye could track. With a mouth of razor-sharp teeth, claws to eight centimeters long on their feet, and a kick powerful enough to take the head off a massive ice-walking Kent, they were near-perfect lad predators. The night beasts hailed from Nyx, a high-gravity Class XI death world far out on the northern galactic rim, and thankfully not anywhere else. Calling them sentient was a matter of debate. They had no technology to monitor. No one had dared step foot on their world long enough to study them peacefully, and those that were taken by force tended to be less than cooperative. Indeed, no less than three ships had had their crews slaughtered to a being after poaching a live night beast. In two of the cases, where scans showed only the creature alive on board, the ships were all railgunned into oblivion just to be on the same side. The insurance companies would have much rather written them off as a total loss than risked recovering them. The third case had been different. The ship had been recovered in orbit around Nix, with a single escape pod missing and nothing but dead bodies aboard. Logs indicated that the creature had gotten loose when the ship was some 20,000 light years away, warping space at full speed for its home port. Curiously, in order to make the ship reverse course, the emergency lockdown had to have been somehow overridden and the ship's AI reprogrammed. That's not to say no study whatsoever had been done on these things. Solitary specimens had been killed, collected, and studied, but there was only so much a carcass could tell scientists. From the necropsies, they said their brains seemed capable of intelligent thought, but theory and practice were often very different. There was no way of knowing for sure, but AIs tasked with decrypting their language from one or two illicit probes seemed to think that they were capable. But the recordings of the escape indicated on all three of those vessels played back nothing more than an inarticulate screams of rage, untranslatable gibberish, and demands for intercourse. Intercourse this, intercourse that, intercourse you, and so on even as they tore throats out with their bare hands and disemboweled stomachs with clawed bare feet. These were, of course, blatant mistranslations despite AI protestations to the contrary. Since the most recent incident years ago, Antikton hadn't heard of anyone else illegally visiting the planet, let alone claiming one of the beasts. It could have been that they were simply successful and no one heard about it, but he doubted it. Then two standard weeks ago, he and his crew of mostly willing servants had been offered more credits than he'd seen outside a lottery drawing for one of the monstrosities alive and in good condition. Having a veterinarian who couldn't refuse to work had been a gift from the five lords of heaven. He had agreed to procure the night beast for a very noble buyer, a member of the idle rich, interested in exotic animals for his menagerie. The pay would be an enormous and included capture tools, medical equipment like tranquilizers, and a translator for his vet to implant, and retrofitting his ship to hold the thing before the venture had even begun. The translator was almost funny, with the thing not so expensive and hazardous to implant. The buyer had insisted that if worse came to worse, they should try to reason with rather than kill and lose what credits he had already invested. The easy part was acquiring it. 
It had been off on a solo night hunt somewhere in the plains of Nix's broken surface when they found it. It only took one dot of an especially developed drug used to tranquilize, though it was so powerful that it could have killed off his entire crew and all of his merchandise were divided up evenly between them. The being had only four appendages, smooth skin with soft lavender tone, and had covered itself in skins that weren't its own. A length of jet black fur swept back from where it had attached the top of its head and ran down where its lower appendages met its torso. Two razor-sharp claws were present on its feet, each almost a decimeter long, with a third tiny vestigial claw on the outsides. Its three fingers on each hand were as blunt as any sentience. It was a large specimen of its kind at 175 centimeters and incredibly dense with heavy muscles. Four men had to carry it onto the levitation pallet and then on into its hardened composite cage, which itself was inside a heavily reinforced cargo hold in the belly of the ship. So far, the creature had killed only three of the crewmen. As far as the Captain Anticton was concerned, there was already an acceptable return on investment. Fewer people to share the prize, and he got to learn who among his men was dumb enough to approach a docile-looking creature during feedings, despite being specifically told not to do so. He had hoped to limit the amount of flesh the thing consumed in order to keep it in a weakened state. But that wasn't going to happen now. It hadn't even finished with the first corpse before it killed the other two crewmen. They had tried to pull their already dead friend from its cage. Instead, they only ended up joining him inside. How a meter and a half wide, two and a half meter tall Tatoran male could fit between ten centimeter wide gaps in the bars was one of the mysteries of nature. It went to show that if one pulled hard enough, anything was possible. The captain wasn't worried. The night beast ate three meals per night cycle, as best as he could tell. They would eventually recover all their wayward crew and as it threw the finished bones from its cage. It had tried to kill a fourth and fifth time, but only managed to take a tentacle off one crewman and a shatter another's upper hip. They hadn't gotten close enough to, no. Video footage proved that the thing had thrown the thigh bones of the consumed crewman at the compatriots with deadly force and accuracy. He hadn't known that it could do that. Quick-witted observers erected a force field between the cage and the entrance to the hold just in time to prevent lethal follow-up projectiles. Not once since it had been here had it done anything but roar and scream. He had tried to talk to it a few times, but got nowhere. His conversations always ended the same way, with him having to blast it with a cold water hard enough to kill a man just to shut it out. It rarely worked out first, but when he did it for long enough, it usually just ended up accepting its fate, silently gasping for air, half drowned in the corner of its cell as the water pounded it. He didn't do that more than a few times. It's not that he felt sorry for it, or didn't feel like getting vengeance for his crew, although he could not care less. It was just that he had better things to do than torture a stupid beast. No, he would definitely not be putting the human anywhere within reach of this thing. The snuff bids on the dismemberment would be valuable, sure, but perhaps not as valuable as a slave from an uncharted world. Those, like Steve N, were totally off record, with no one to come looking for them, and nowhere to escape to. Some of the less reputable slave buyers would pop a top credit for the likes of him. That... And he didn't feel like giving the Night Beast yet another week's worth of hearty meals. End of chapter When Death Will Does Meet, Part 3 The captain caught Kinder's eye and she frowned at the Exo's notion. Apparently, she didn't like the idea of staging animal fights for fun and profit either. But probably for reasons like morality and empathy. No... I don't think I'm going to feed Steve in to the Night Beast. Not today, anyway. Probably. Turning to his exo, Anakton said, Tell me, Marshy, you were part of the tracking and recovery team. Where is this thing from? That's the question of the hour, said the other man, using a set of grasping tentacles to rub his proboscis. He may have been part of a convoy, fell out of a massive group warp bubble, 
and become lost. Each ship has a warp fuel generator on its own, but it's small and crude. Tukukukukuruk in engineering looked at the computer too, to try and find out where it came from. But even with the AI helping, she says that it's totally bricked. We think that's what caused him to be stranded in the first place. The ship is powered by a antibatter. What? bellowed the captain. Once we found out, we jettisoned it. Thank the gods and lords. The captain shook his head in disbelief. That's just insane. So wait a minute. If it has a warp drive and is powered by antimatter of all things, why would you jump to the conclusion that it was part of a convoy? It is the only thing that makes sense, Marshy explained. The maximum range of this craft with a full containment field was about 400 light years. 40% of its containment field had been expended, so I take it there are no habitable worlds within 160 light years. You're quick the math, sir, and no. The captain rubbed his forehead bow and sighed. So, it is possible that it will be missed. That's not good news. Maybe they'll chalk it up to the hazards of a driveless warp travel, the Exo reasoned. And if they do come looking, if there's a whole group of these things trying to get somewhere at once, then it must be pretty important. So, I doubt they'll start right away. I've got a super predator and a possible super soldier on my ship. The human was probably part of some alien invasion force heading for one of the fringe territories. His ship looked exactly like an orbital drop pod with a warp fuel generator attached to it, doesn't it? There was some evidence that it was a multi-stage craft, yes. The drive section may have been designed to be discarded in order to allow planetary entry of the capsule. But there is the question of why it would travel using a convoy's warp bubble when it has a perfectly good drive of its own, which it won't use and then discard before planet fall. Could be a standardized design, but uh, I really doubt that. But if that's not the case, then we're back to the questions of range, he huffed. And? And? He lifted his snout from his hand where it'd been and buried in frustration. And there were no weapons aboard the craft, said Mushy. Though he was wearing a surprisingly strong set of armor, it appears to be impervious to vacuum, radiation, heat, cold, small arms fire, large arms fire, poisonous atmosphere, and hostile wildlife, among other things. The thing is tough, but flexible. His people have that kind of technology. Not really, no, the Exo explained, gesturing a tentacle in the negative. Not in the sense that you mean. It's not terribly advanced. Any of the galactic races could make something like that. They just couldn't make use of it. It took four of us just to drag the thing into the cargo hold. The captain's expression went flat. And uh, he was wearing it. Yes, yes he was. In here? And Tukton asked, pointing to the deck. Not on some other extravehicular excursion. Yes, in here. The exo pulled his proboscis tightly shut, the equivalent of pursing his lips. It seemed that he didn't like where this conversation was going either. A thought occurred to the Terran. Then how in the seven hells in Borrigan did you even get him out of it? Oh, um, we asked him to remove it. Asked? Yes, he's very nice. I don't give a crap how nice he is. I just, uh... Marshy hastened to interrupt. Sir, I don't think he knows he's been abducted into slavery. That was just plain dumb. His assessment of the being's race fell a few notches. On the other hand, it was entirely possible that a genetic freak was not a representation of his people. In fact, it was entirely likely that he wasn't. The more he thought about it, the more it made sense. If this was a super soldier on its way to war, the thing had only to sit in the pod and land and fight. It didn't need to be very smart, which might have contributed to why its computer was destroyed. Explained how it couldn't find its way back, and explained why it didn't know that it was a piece of merchandise. Heck, the thing was probably so dumb that its people wouldn't even be bothered to give it a gun until after it landed and had a safe direction in which to point it. It was probably programmed to be compliant and take orders, which was why it seemed to get along with everyone else. One more thing before I go, sir, the vet said meekly. He had forgotten that Ginter was even standing there. It, well, it looks similar to, well, um... To what? To, 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 um... She started softly. Spit it out! He said impatiently, motioning for her to continue. That thing, 
she whispered, pointing to the deck below her feet. The captain and Exo each sucked in a breath of air. He hadn't thought about it, but more he did, the more the captain realized that she was right. They were both bipedal tetrapods, for one. It was an efficient but inherently unstable design, suited for organisms that were either on the move or at rest and nowhere in between. They were both mostly bald for another. Their heads were a different shape, but not really as much as any two other species might have been. The coloration was different. This human was pale, mottled cream color, and the night beasts generally were anywhere from light blue to purple to jet black. They were the same general height, from heel to scalp, though the human might have been taller and bulkier, actually. And then there were the eyes, forward-facing, like gun barrels aimed right at you. Bright and dangerous. He hoped that the humans didn't glow like the night beasts did. The thought sent a chill down his spine. On the other hand, comparing the two just felt played stupid. Engineered soldier or not, Stephen was one step above a friendly pet and came from a people with an adequate technology. If this were a true case of convergent evolution, his people would also have to be from a class 11 death world, almost exactly like Nick's. That simply couldn't be because death worlds did not, could not produce true sentience, only feral monstrosities. The captain rolled his eyes and sighed internally. He would still perform his due diligence and try his best to determine if the thing was posed any real risks, even if it was highly skeptical. Axo, is it safe to talk to uh, the human? He asked. I think so, said Marshy, with Ginter nodding in agreement. His translator is working great now, and I was chatting with him for a bit. Told him I had to lock him up in his room for operational security reasons. He didn't have the clearance to be wondering about. I think he bought it. After all, we've learned of him. I wouldn't let slip that he's anything other than a guest. He might not be as a compliant. The captain thought for a moment. Ginter, in your evening is cancelled. You'll start developing poisons and sedatives to use on this thing immediately. Airborne, but harmless to everyone else, if possible. Go, now. The woman nodded and slowly trotted off the bridge. Even her hoofbeats sounded dejected. I am going to have the chat with Stephen before I retire for the evening, said Captain Antictun. With that, he stood from his chair and left without another word. End of chapter. When Death Wilders Meet, Part 4 the captain pulled up the one chair in the cell and took a seat. Across from him, their guest lounged on his padded bunk. It was meant to be uncomfortably small, but with him it seemed decadently large. His unusual coverings were folded up behind him as a pillow, and a blanket covered him from his waist to his toes. His chest and arms were exposed, showing off his substantial musculature. Less than a meter of space stood between them in this padded cell. Nice place you got here, the human said. I stayed in a terrestrial ship once and they'd got nothing on you guys. Compared to our spaceport, well, this ship's like a floating palace. How do you do it? The captain certainly hadn't expected to be praised for the accommodations. But given its small stature and the confines of the craft they found him in, he should not have been surprised. Well, we value our guests and strive to provide the best that we can offer for them, he replied trying his best to sound sincere. Gods and lords, this thing was stupid. But the bunks for our crew are what you might typically find on any military or patrol spacecraft. This was a lie across the board. He had no idea what the inside of a military or patrol craft looked like. Had his quarters with two stories and about a hundred square meters. Wow, thank you for the gas treatment then, the human said. And I want to thank you for rescuing me out there, I thought... Uh, I thought that module would be by two, uh, buried alive in space. The captain could emphasize. It was any space's worst nightmare. He suppressed a shudder. Really, sending this man into a life of servitude was doing him a favor. His potential buyer wouldn't put such a novelty to work at hard labor when he could be used for a conversation piece. He would probably spend his days entertaining and doing parlor tricks as a house slave. Not a bad way to love. Better than death by starvation in a metal pod. Well, it was the least we could do here on the Bright Hope, he said. 
The ship's name was the Halcyon Harvester. We were a few light years out, but when we picked up your warp field collapsing and saw that you couldn't get going again, well, we knew that we had to help. You can actually detect warp bubbles on other vessels, real time from light years away, the human asked, setting up a little straighter in his bunk. Had he been taller, he would have hit his head. The captain was taken aback. He definitely hadn't expected the human to have cared of something like that. He hadn't even expected him to be capable of caring about something like that. Well, um, yeah, and Tik Tung replied, rubbing his chin. How do you do it? The smaller man asked. Does the warp field project itself ahead of the bubble, or maybe the compressed space causes ripples ahead of it, like a stone in water? This creature was not stupid, not by a long shot. That, um, that sort of technology is classified, Captain Antikton replied. In truth, he had no idea how the hell they did it. That was probably a question for the guys who built the sensor suite that they bought. All right, like the Prime Directive, Stevens said. Perhaps seeing the confusion on the captain's face, he hastened to clarify. Humans have speculated that there might be a rule that prevents more advanced sentience from providing technology to less advanced sentience for fear of disrupting the natural course of their development. Ah, no, that was about the stupidest thing that he'd ever heard. It's more of a security issue. We can't give away our technology when we don't know how it might be used. That was a lie, of course but much more believable than the idea that he or anyone else who wasn't an anthropologist gave a flying shit about the development of some primitives. Nothing aboard his ship could be procured by anyone in the open market in a spacecraft or law enforcement supply store. He just didn't want to admit to this human that he had no idea how the sensors worked, and this excuse played well in keeping their guests behind a locked door. May I ask some questions about you? Antikton asked, to get a better idea of your status. Of course, of course, came the quick reply. Good. The captain made a show of pulling out a data pad and a stylus. So, uh, what is your profession? I am an explorer, the human said with a nod, an almost universal indicator of yes. You are not a soldier, the captain asked. You were wearing armor when we found you, and beneath that, you wore coverings with insignia. Oh no, he replied. I used to be an airman. The captain's translator supplied warrior whose domain is aerospace for the unusual human speak word. That his people had a single simple word for that was disconcerting. Still, there were plenty of harmless races with deep martial traditions. But I'm a civilian. Civilian became one who was not serving in the military, as if that wasn't already an assumption in the language. Again, disconcerting but not terribly unusual. What are you exploring? The captain asked, idly typing nonsense into his data pad. Oh, the, the galaxy, said Stephen. I'm conducting humanity's first man extrasolar space flight and our first man effective FDL test. It didn't go as planned. We kind of figured that out as we recovered you from the void, said the captain, and those symbols on your skin covering, they remind me of some military identifications and rank that I've seen in a few races using... He pulled his coverings from behind him, a bright orange one-piece with numerous pockets, zippers, fasteners, and insignia. Not at all. None of these are even remotely related to the military, he said, pointing at each one in turn as he explained. This one is a government-funded explorer organization I work for called NASA. This one is a government that funds it, the United States of America. These are for the mission and the spacecraft that brought me here and malfunctioned. Project Pathfinder and Victoria. This last patch with the wings means that I'm a pilot, and it has my first name, Stephen, and my family name, McLaren, my tribe name, Lieutenant Colonel, and my clan name, Usaf. Okay, the captain replied. I thought as much. So, this thing really wasn't an engineered super soldier, or any kind of soldier at all, for that matter. That still left other questions. And my suit wasn't armor, Stephen continued, folding his orange skin covering. It's just for survival in case of a hull breach. Were you genetically engineered? asked the captain. No, not at all. 100% natural. Why? It is just one of those questions we have to ask. There have been concerns with unnatural biological contaminations, he said. Again, not true at all. But it sounded better than, I need to know if I should put you in a stronger cage. The captain licked his teeth and snout. 
Next question. Are you carnivorous? For a moment, the man said nothing as he drew his eyebrows together. Like an expression for confusion, perhaps. He mean like, um, eating meat. The single word meat had been translated as flesh of prey animal. Now that was a red flag. End of chapter. When Death Will This Meet, Part 5 Yes, that is exactly what I mean by carnivorous. Although we just call, the captain used the human word, meat, flesh. We have no special words for that, uh, provide additional context. Right, um, well, uh, uh, we aren't carnivals, said the human. Not at all, I mean, uh, we can digest flesh, if it's been laboriously prepared and heat treated, but no one ever does it, and it's just morally wrong to kill something to just eat it. The idea of it is just disgusting, but because of its extremely high caloric density, it's sometimes artificially grown to use as emergency rations. I see. That explains why it was in the food preparations on your craft. I guess there was some in those meals, now that you mention it, Stephen offered, scratching his face. I just never eat that part. I mean, uh, we're not even designed for it. Look at our teeth. The ones up front are for chopping vegetables, and the ones at the back are for grinding coarse plant matter. That seemed reasonable enough. And your eyes, he asked. They face forward, binocular vision. Oh, humans are descended from arboreal mammals, he explained. We jumped from tree to tree, swinging on vines. We obviously needed the depth perception to be able to properly time our jumps, grab the vines, and escape dangerous predators that were faster, larger, and stronger. You lived with carnivores on your planet, ones larger and stronger than you, with, well, no defense, but, um... With no natural defenses to protect yourself. Um, well, yeah, he said slowly, scratching his face. We got lucky, you know, evolving intelligence to avoid them, and we were pretty safe, building our tree villages high up off the ground where no predator could reach us. You seem to have a lot of muscle mass, the captain said. He showed his own arm to the man, spreading his thick layer of feathers flat. It looked spindly next to Stephen's though it was much longer and attached to his taller frame. Well, it is necessary for our lifestyle, Stephen said. I imagine you evolved from six-legged ground dweller, but we humans need an extra muscle to support our entire weight on only two legs, to climb trees, to jump from one tree to another, and to grab onto the things and lift our entire body weight up in a single hand, if necessary. And our world has pretty high gravity compared to here. I think it was once told that if our gravity was any higher, we could never have achieved early spaceflight with chemical rockets. Makes sense, the captain said. How high is your gravity anyway? Um, I don't know the space units or whatever. But a meter is this long, Stephen said, indicating the height on the bulkhead. The captain made a note. And the acceleration of gravity at my planet's sea level is 9.8 for those per second squared. Does that help? And a second is uh, one, two, three. The captain noted the tempo of the man's counting and plugged that and the other information into his data pad and waited for his ship's AI to do the calculations. Though a rough approximation, the results were staggering. 4.2 galactic standard gravities. Unbelievable. Still, that the human was strong told him nothing. They already knew that just from the weight of his environmental suit. That didn't even mean that he or his people were dangerous, nor did anything else he had learned thus far, aside from the peculiarities of their language. Those types of errors were bound to crop up from time to time, and should always be taken with a lick of salt. Wars had been started over worse, and sometimes better, translations. You seem to be very intelligent, very reasonable, an utterly harmless being, Stephen, he told the human, and I am very glad to have rescued you. He meant that the thing would fetch a fortune. As a nobleman's personal acrobat, he could be wonderfully entertaining to watch. Why, thank you, the other man replied with a laugh. I'm glad you rescued me too. What happens now? Oh, well, if you can tell us where you live, then we'll get you back home. He replied. The post-primitive explorer could never know. 
at least in any system Antictum could recognize the astronomical coordinates of its own star. It was a safe offer. Otherwise, we take you to somewhere to be processed into the galactic community, and we ultimately set you up with a job. No one eats for free. Of course, the other man said, nodding. But I don't know where my world is. Antictum was quite glad and not at all surprised to hear that. It would make things a lot less awkward if he didn't have to refuse to take Stephen home. Nevertheless, he would play along. Hmm, that's not going to make this easy. Is there anything that you can tell me where your world is? But he placed his hand on the smaller man's shoulder and gave his best comforting expression. What if I gave you the galaxy map to look at? No, uh, that, that won't help her. Uh, it means nothing to me, the human said, scratching his face again. Oh well, said the captain, using body language to indicate his own helplessness. The human probably wouldn't understand it, but it was a natural response. He really, honestly, couldn't do anything to help him, and thankfully, Stephen was perfectly willing to accept that, which felt rather oddly convenient. Are you sure you don't want to see the galaxy map? Antikton asked, putting one up in the data pad. I can show you where we picked you up. Well, I can certainly take a look, Stephen said as the captain turned the map on the data pad to face him, a single point clearly marked. After a moment, the human replied, No, no, this doesn't help at all. Sorry. Do you know, maybe, the distance and direction that you have traveled, or where are supposed to have traveled? The captain asked, prodding a little further. No, the other man said, shaking his head. No idea. The ship was fully automated. I was just inside of it as a publicity stunt, more than anything. So the human government could say, we sent a man farther than ever before with this new starship engine and brought him home safely. Too bad they missed up on that second part, am I right? Indeed. The captain definitely began to feel something just wasn't adding up. There was no way this being, as smart as it was, didn't know how far it had traveled, even if it couldn't tell the direction. They would have been planning for months for a newly advanced people's first expedition past this solar system. He would have known the distance and probably the direction too. He would have had to have seen the galaxy map of some kind, even just a section of it. The captain could have zoomed into a 200 light year radius of where they found him and Stephen should have been able to orient himself. Space was three dimensional, but the galaxy was on a plane, damn it. Common celestial landmarks wasn't that abstract a concept to understand. A moment please. He told the human before turning his attention to the pad in his hand, this time not merely for the sake of appearance. The captain typed in a message to the ship's AI as quickly as he could. List all habitable worlds within 200 light years of where we picked up the human. No worlds matching that criteria, came the reply. He thought for a moment as a deeply unsettling feeling just barely tickled at the edges of his mind. He typed again. List all worlds that meet the following criteria. Oxygen in the atmosphere, liquid water on the surface, gravity between three and five standard units. Location within 200 light years of where we found the human. One world found, RGT 9873A-3. Discovered by Tzitzitic explorers, its name, Kritik Ikadrol Yolt Isk, translates to loss of sanity in broken blue with hope abandoned. This world is not habitable, he typed. He knew damn well what the answer was to that. No, RGT 9873A-3 is a class 12. Habitation not possible. Galactic regulation prevents approach within 100 standard light years. General quarantine in effect. The captain blinked slowly and swallowed hard. He felt his heart thumping at his chest, pounding harder and faster with each passing second. His hands began to shake and his legs fell loose. A sickening, sinking weight grew in the pit of his stomach. He took a deep breath, blinking again, and turned his data pad off. He wanted the screen locked if the inevitable came out of nowhere. His side off weighed heavily on his side. He dare not even look at it. It would only get him killed faster. End of chapter. When Death Will This Meet, Part 6 Life harboring worlds were graded on a scale for habitability to sentient life. A class 1 world 
was a perfect garden world. Glass two worlds might have chilly weather. His own world was considered rather sheer, good for developing a tough and hardy people. It was a class five. Class six worlds were tough places that few visited. Some of the fiercest warrior peoples came from them. They got worse as the numbers went up. There was only one race participating in the galactic community from a class eight world, and most people avoided them at all costs. From there, they became even harsher and more hazardous to sentient life, all the way up to Class X worlds, which were considered uninhabitable. Death worlds. Sentients did not, could not come from a death world. Of course, just because something had never happened before didn't mean that it could never happen. He just wished that it hadn't have happened on his ship. The habitation scale for temperature planets was pretty linear from 1 to 10. It was supposed to end there. But at some point, scientists noticed that there were worlds which went to such great lengths to exterminate all life that they far surpassed even Class 10. Learned minds developed an extended scale, and each step in that scale was exponentially more deadly than the previous one. Class 11 worlds, like Nyx, home of the night beasts, were almost a joke. A 1 to 10 scale turned up to 11. As for class 12, well, he hadn't heard of such a thing until this very moment when it had suddenly stopped being funny. Is, um, something wrong? The creature asked. Gave a talking to it. His mind pleaded with his body, willing his tongue to move as his lips to part. No, 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 not at all, the captain said, clasping his hands together in an effort to get them to stop shaking. He had an idea. Half-formed and conceived in terror, but an idea nonetheless. Carefully, he turned his data pad back on. He had to type much slower. His fingers kept missing the correct spots, even on the second and third tries. He typed with two, then three digits tightly pressed together to lessen the shaking. This time, his message was to Ginter, the ship's vet. Have you completed the drug yet? A few moments later came a long reply. No... We've been testing the different things on blood and tissue samples, but nothing seems to work. And even if it did, we probably wouldn't be able to manufacture enough of it aboard for it to matter. What about the night beast tranquilizer? He typed. Might work. The two are similar, high metabolic rate, blood-based and iron-carrying oxygen. Other things. Or it might do nothing. She was damn right that they were similar, but if it didn't work... How many doses do we have left? Only two. If the human is compliant, it only makes sense to save them in case we need them for... her. He let out a slow breath of air, closed his eyes, and concentrated. She was right, of course. This thing, less than a meter from him, was compliant for the moment. Pointing a weapon like a dark gun at it would almost certainly trigger it to kill. Unlike a night beast, there was no possible way a creature as smart and as advanced as this would not know what a gun was. And this ship was too small to allow it to be shot from a relative safety of great distance. In these confines, he had no doubt that the thing could kill or disarm, literally, an attacker faster than anyone aboard could even pull the trigger. And all that was assuming that the night beast sedative would even work. He could also forget locking it in its cabin. For one, he could probably beat down the thin door without much trouble. For another, that would only postpone the problem. It would eventually find out that it was taken by a slave ship. If night beasts were any indication, death worlders could not just accept that fact, regardless of the circumstances or conditions. When it would find out, well, he would maybe hope that it would be after finding a buyer and making a sale. But Antigton couldn't be certain. Until then, it would be like having an unexploded warhead rolling around in storage. No worse, a primitive class 11 would just kill everyone aboard, steal his ship, and escape home. An advanced class 12. Not even Antigton's family was safe. Seven hells, the thing would probably take his ship, infiltrate his homeworld, find a way to blow it up, and then escape home. Antigton had to deal with this now. So the drugs were a complete waste. Honestly, had the veterinarian been watching vids of this entire time, couldn't she appreciate how potentially dangerous this thing was? He needed another idea, 
something that he could actually use. He might be able to think of a way to fool it, to take advantage of its current willingness to cooperate in order to eliminate it as a threat. That meant a battle of wits with a being whose race had intelligence as it is only natural weapon, an intelligence which allowed them to evolve on, survive on, thrive on, and probably, like most sentients, dominate on its own world. And that home world was a death world. They were all going to die painfully. I agree with your assessment, thank you, he typed to Ginter, wondering if it would be his last message. Better to go out with some sense of satisfaction. Before tomorrow, I need you to clean out the waste chutes and all the slave quarters. Yes, all of them. Despite his almost complete inability to think of anything beyond getting the hells out of there, one more idea passed its way through his forebrain only because he had already been toying with the notion earlier. He just had to calm himself and maintain enough control to carry it out. It wasn't going to be pretty, but it was probably the only thing Anticton could do to keep himself, his ship, and most of his merchandise in one piece. If the Night Beast somehow died, it was only a financial loss. He would be in debt to his investor, maybe sold into slavery if he had to default, but he'd be alive. He might even be able to buy his way out of it eventually. On the other hand, if the human died, he would build a shrine to the five lords of heaven, regardless of the outcome. He saw no other choice. I want to give you a tour of the ship, he smoothly told the creature. How does that sound? Yeah, sure, the thing said. The captain swallowed his sigh of relief. Together they walked from deck to deck and room to room, the captain explaining briefly what each part of the ship was used for. He had to make most of it up as he wasn't too clear on what his crew did, what they did, or why or how they did it. For their part, the crew were thankfully silent as the odd pair walked about, knowing better than to ask questions. Either that, or they were too put off by the rumors of the human that were doubtlessly already spreading. Though he showed the crew quarters, the captain made sure to avoid the standing slave cells amidship. That would have raised too many questions. As for the special slave cell, well, they were going to go visit that one now. I noticed there are dozens of different species represented here, said the cheerful human as they walked. I talked to your executive officer about it earlier. It's wonderful, you know. A whole galactic community up here, just waiting for humanity to join. The creature seemed so earnest and to turn, but at the same time, he couldn't help but feel like it was onto his ruse and was implying a veiled threat. He could imagine it smiling as it happily slaughtered its way through every living thing aboard, all the while saying how much it wanted to meet his whole community. Oh yes, there are more than a few races aboard, the captain agreed. We cannot wait for a people as nice as you to join us either. In fact, as a representative of your people, I think it is extremely important that you meet all of the races of the galactic community. I can't do much about the ones we don't have aboard here. How many are there? Other races in the galaxy. The captain's pace staggered. Was it normal for this creature's people to interrupt, or was it trying to throw him off? Well, uh, I don't know for sure, he replied. What about on this ship? Twenty-six different races, I believe, he replied, though the numbers change so frequently. In truth, he had no idea, but the thing had said he'd seen dozens aboard, so... The human nodded, and they continued on their way. As I was saying... It'll be important when you return to your kind to have a fully interacted with as many different races of people as possible. There is someone special I would like you to meet. How is your night vision? The captain asked, opening the door to a darkened room at the base of the large ramp. Captain Antikton held his breath. The thing's next answer would doom or save him. Not good, he said. Why? He thanked every god, lord, and demon he could think of. Because we're going to go say hello, he said, gesturing for the human to enter the pitch black cargo hold. As the human entered, Antikton remained a pace behind him. It's dark in here because she's nocturnal. She won't mind being woken up to meet you, though. No, not at all. Let me find a light switch. W one second, where is it? May maybe over here? The cargo bay door slammed shut in front of him with a reverberating thud, trapping the human on the other side with the Night Beast. End of chapter.
When death will this meet? Part 7. Arenas woke with a start. The takers were back. She was sure of it before she even opened her eyes. Back to inflict more misery. After they took her, the first time they came to her cell, they brought her a prisoner rations. The hand-sized portion she supposed was meant to last a full night. They gave her a thin, pasty, foul-smelling gruel made from naught but roots and leaves. It barely filled her stomach for a time, and did little else. She could probably digest a tenth of it, perhaps. They'd stop feeding her after that night, instead coming only to talk, then scream at her. They offered more gruel for cooperation. When she had refused to respond, they tormented her with water as freezing as a stream from the high country, and more forceful than the western Paratana River. By the third day, she was weak and delirious with hunger. She would have killed them had she a chance, to be sure. Not only would their behavior have warranted death, were they her own kind, but these were the monsters of her childhood. Everyone in her land had been taught about the Takers since the time that they were children. Never travel, pray, or hunt alone, they said. They would find you and steal you away. Never be hurt from again. If you're lucky, they said, they will kill you before they take you, and only your body will be lost. If they took you to the sky, your immortal soul would be doomed to wander from star to star, searching for home. Only one person had ever gotten away from them, and Arinus was no Martianess, Captain General Il Manoc. She remembered seeing her orations as a young girl and hearing all the stories. She remembered rolling her eyes, not just thinking, but knowing that they were fables and tales of fancy meant to keep children from getting lost or hurt. But the Almighty, how wrong she was! One thing she did not expect, however, was that she would have to eat her childhood monsters just to survive. That was unexpected. The worst part was how they upset her stomach, modestly, and tasted of six different kinds of foulness. Still, suffering from indigestion and ill humors had to be better than starving to death or going blind from lack of meat. It wasn't an ideal situation. The things were tall but terribly skinny, and most had thick layers of fur or feathers. That meant that there wasn't much food to be had. Perhaps enough good meat on each for three steak pie suppers, and uh, from the gristle, maybe another two blocks of head cheese or a dozen rings of black pudding. That was the best case scenario. But quite a bit of the leftovers had started to turn. She, of course, had to dine without the benefit of proper butcher's preparation. Part of her wondered if that made her a cannibal, but the rest of her didn't give a damn. She was mad with hunger when she accidentally killed the first one, hungrier than when she ate it, and knew that she would be hungry again when she killed its friends. Were they people just because they could talk? She doubted it. They didn't look like people. They looked like scared cattle or seafood that could talk. Would she have eaten a talking fish if she was hungry enough? Apparently so. On the sixth day, like every day before, someone came to yell and blast her with frozen water until her flesh was raw and torn. She realized something important in that moment. The water had pounded Aranus while she huddled in the formless mass of rotwood, pressed to the ground over the corpses of her enemies, holding their bones, skin, and offal tight to her chest to stop the sustaining remnants from washing away. She knew that she had become an animal. A fearsome, unintelligent beast concerned with nothing but survival. That knowledge brought her a kind of peace. They thought of her as an animal, caged her like an animal. So she would stop fighting it and become an animal. She cursed them all the way to the demon king himself and, for her trouble, screamed herself hoarse in the process. She knew better than to say anything that could remotely be useful to them. Nothing could help her now, least of all dignifying them with any real response. She had trained as a home guardswoman since her twelfth year, been a sapper since her fifteenth, and a longbowman since her eighteenth. She had studied for countless fortnights to earn those positions, and those vellum texts had etched themselves onto her mind. 
The first rule of being captured by the enemy was to give them nothing and tell them nothing because they would use everything against you. And now, now, they had woken her up to torture her yet again. After two whole nights and days of peace, she had begun to faintly hope that they had had their full of inflicting suffering. In the intervening nights, she had barely enough time to dry the redness of her wounds with the torn remnants of her chemise. It had been too much to hope for. Holding herself, she had begun to shake in place, clenching her teeth and squeezing her eyes shut to hold back the tears. Baroness would not let them see her suffer. She slowly opened her eyes, listening to their noises. She again accepted her fate. The witch fire wall between her cage and the surrounding room would let in things like water and sounds and probably arrows, but none of the same could she send outwards, nor could she be heard. I think there's been a mistake here. She could hear someone say, his voice, his real voice, not the one the imp they put into her ear used, sounded different from the others. It reminded her of barking, higher pitched than theirs, but still sounded deep to her, like a man's. She had never seen it before, but the new visitor looked almost like a proper gentleman, though his legs were too straight and his face a bit odd. He looked much more normal than the other monsters, and much more approachable, more personable. If he was indeed a monster at all, and not something else entirely. Whatever it was, it was with the takers, and she would kill it. She had no room for mercy in her heart, for any of the takers, all their serfs, servants, kith, or kin. If the opportunity presented itself, it would die like the others and sustain her for another week, at least. On the off chance that the witch fire yielded so the creature could approach, she began scraping around the floor. She would find a bone to throw from amongst her rotting friends that served her only food and companionship. She first found a fragment of a skull from the one she had named Firemlay, the brain scooped out days ago. They had been too fatty, but with a pleasant measure of saltiness. She threw it aside. A whole skull might have been better, but his, uh, like the others, had been crushed when she pulled them through the bars. Reaching down again, she found his jaw. More beak, more something. Whatever it was, though spindly, it was large and had quite a bit more heft than the other remaining pieces. It would more than suffice to dispatch one of these feeble takers. She approached the bars slowly, as if she was stalking game, which, in a sense, she was. The strange visitor was distracted, knocking on the door to the outer room, asking to... Uh, in an instant, the witch's fire hum died, and she threw. Her sudden reaction surprised even herself. She hardly expected the witch fire to actually depart, nor even realized that she'd been preparing to throw. Oh well, it is what it was. Any second thoughts on the matter were pointless. Bye, fire and less, jaw break. Goodbye, new visitor. One of the Empress's best archers, Aranus, aim had to be true. The new visitor did, and ow! Oh! Who bonked me? Aranus let out a squeak, jumping back three whole paces and upwards at least two. She landed with a bang, followed by an awkward scrambling of claws on metal as she righted herself. That wasn't supposed to happen. It definitely wasn't dead, and she'd only made it cross. It had moved so quick she hadn't even seen the thing turn to face her, nor take up what was unmistakably a fighting stance. Unlike with every other being on the ship, some of whom were twice her height, she suddenly became aware of how much larger than her she was. Suddenly, Aranus really wanted to apologize. Hello, um, who's there? The man demanded. He took a step back and began scanning the dark room. That fecking hurt, right in the head too. I think I'm bleeding, damn it. It stomped its foot onto the floor in frustration, so loud that she jumped. She could feel the vibrations moving through the ground and into her. Human, the wall spoke. She recognized that voice. It was the warden, the evil creature, that vile thing that she wanted dead more than life itself. What had it done to her? She suppressed a shiver, just thinking about it. Amen to you, Deathbuilder. 
The voice continued from the raised dentation in the wall. We know what your people are, what they are capable of, and now you've met your match. Human from lost sanity, meet the night beast from Nyx. You may now kill each other. End of chapter. Human from Lost Sanity, meet the Night Beast from Nyx. You may now kill each other. No, no, no. She wasn't some Night Beast, not at all. Just a woman, a farm girl really, with a meaningless title. An unimportant woman, hardly worth mentioning, actually. Aranus silently cursed the warden as the creature. This man named Huben blindly searched for her. She tried to secrete herself into the corner of the cage with as little sound as possible. It didn't work. She could see the man's eyes tracking her, honing in on her hiding spot. Like the others, she doubted it could not see without the sun, but that seemed to make little to no difference. She'd made almost no sound, but we could hear her moving. Maybe even breathing. She felt sure of it. The damn thing came from a place called Lost Sanity, too. With a name like that, the place could have been some fantastic underworld from the epic poem where beings didn't need sight to see. For the first time in weeks, her rage had fully given way to fear. She heard her cage opening, the clockwork engines deep within cycling. At any point, the time that she had arrived in this cursed dungeon until now, she would have prayed for her cell to be open. Now, she fervently prayed for it to remain shut. What the hell is a night beast? The human asked, his eyes slightly shifting to the winding hinge. She gulped. It wasn't her. No, definitely not her. No way. She began to wonder if one of her skeleton friends could maybe cover for her. Rude Digatha, Ophenble, Terran Guard, anyone. None volunteered. Traitors, the lot of them. Yeah, doom, shouted the warden. Doom, doom, doom. If they fought and she actually ended up killing this man, it would be an absolute miracle. Against one of her fellow dames, strikes to the head like the one she just delivered would have laid them all low to a woman, if even for just a moment. That huge man hadn't even lost his footing. She was hardly his doom. A better descriptor might be more difficult than average sparring dummy. She is a carnivorous killing machine with razor-sharp teeth, massive claws, and a taste for intelligent meat. We'll see who survives. All technically true, but really. What the feck? screamed the human, banging on the door with lining fast punches. From across the room, she could feel each impact in her bones. She didn't want to be anywhere near this creature. You want me to fight some animal? What is this? Some kind of gladiator blood sport? Why would you do that? What? I'm a simple man, a small, defenseless herbivore. You're just going to feed me to it. Why? I have no chance. It was bargaining. Or it knew she was listening and hoping to lull her into complacency. Either way, she was highly skeptical. Ha! <laughs> it's not any bigger than you, said the warden. You might stand a chance. Jesus Christ, mountain lions aren't any bigger than me either, the human yelled back. When I get out of here, I'll feckin' kill you, slaver scum. And now, she wanted to be his friend. That might have been easier said than done. Sure, she could just march right up to the gentleman, introduce herself, explain herself and her terrible mistake, and hope for the best. It might work. The second rule of being taken prisoner was to find allies and unite with your fellow prisoners around the common goals of resistance and escape. They certainly had a common enemy, and the gentleman was surely intelligent enough to see that. On the other hand, this man could be extremely dangerous, and might not even be in his right mind, if the name of his homeland meant anything. Not only that, but she could clearly see and smell that she'd drawn first blood. Though she would seek his forgiveness, he need not offer it, and without it, he was entitled to strike her down. And at that moment, he seemed rather angry. Aranus pushed all of fear and down to sight. Only cooperation would lead to salvation. She took a deep breath and drew herself up to a full height and slowly strode towards the human. 
They were not going to fight for the sadist's amusement. They were going to clear this up like a lady and a gentleman that they were. She would first work up the courage to introduce herself to the human, and together, the pair would find a way out of this mess. For the first time since being taken, she began to feel a glimmer of hope. If you get out of here, you can come find me, human, said the warden from the wall. I think the beast talking towards you right now will have something else to say about that. In a flash, it turned from the warden's voice and looked her right in the eyes. She froze. Crap, it had been playing blind. Not if I kill it first, you son of a bark. Wait, stop. My, my name is Araness of the Karamast, daughter of... The world went white around her and she fell to her knees. She couldn't breathe. She had to vomit, but couldn't gag. Her limbs flew to her throat as she gasped for air, frantically trying to roll away from the human as the looming man stalked towards her. She hadn't even seen what had happened. He'd moved so fast. It hit her in hard in the throat, either with a punch or using a hand like a knife to jab or slash. It hadn't been as effective as a claw kick might have been. But it struck faster and would be no less deadly if it happened a second time. Regaining her parents, she began scooting backwards away from the man. With one hand, she searched for bones and pulled herself along. With the other, she massaged her almost useless throat. With her legs, she used one to push herself away, holding the other aloft but ready to kick out at the human's torso. Please, she croaked, rubbing her throat, imploring the lunatic man, Stop! Mark, our spark, Mark! It danced around, clearly wary of a clawed foot. She struck out, barely tearing its silk tunic as it dodged. She had been taught never to hit a gentleman, but she would definitely make an exception in this case. It pushed towards her from the side, and she moved back in equal measure. It hurt to breathe, and she was fast running out of room to maneuver. She kicked again, and it dodged just as quickly. My name, Aranus, she wheezed again, her words sounding strangled. She had to explain that she was a person, Tabbit, not a beast, daughter of Lady Jurisalka. This time, the man lunged with an arm. She kicked at it and missed. She barely spotted the man's other arm as it tried to catch her foot. She rolled in place, bringing that extended foot to the ground while her other foot spun up to take its place, tearing deeply into the man's forearm. It barked in rage. She scooted back another two spaces. I'm Commander, she croaked. What madness had come over this thing? Did it just like killing things in her Imperial Majesty's order? She had slid away right into the corner. The man had planned it that way, and she had played right into it. She was just another cornered animal fighting for her life. Another lunge, another kick in response. She was ready for when he tried to catch her foot again, and kicked up with the other leg. This time, she missed. The human caught her by his second foot, his other hand quickly grabbing her leg by the hook and seizing it firmly in place. In an instant, he rolled to the ground keeping his body on the side of her immobile leg, stopping her from kicking out with either. He fell atop her, releasing her leg as he landed. He rolled her a chest first into the ground, while she alternated between elbowing his ribs and stomach and using her fists to hammer at his thighs. Setting all decency aside in desperation, she tried to grab and tear at his manhood, but he kept his hips firmly pressed against her, leaving no room to strike. She tried another tactic, Pushed herself off the ground. That only made things worse. Using the gap between her body and the floor, the man wrapped one arm around her entire body just beneath her bosom, locking her arms at her sides and crushing her torso into his. She began throwing her head backwards, fighting with every scrap of energy and whatever tools she had left at her disposal. She felt gratified when the back of her head made contact with the man's odd nose, feeling it crushed as it made a soft, clacking noise. It was odd. She had always enjoyed hand-to-hand -hand combat. Were she not facing a certain and swift death, she might have admitted to finding the sensations of the heart-breathing gentleman holding her tightly, pressing his body into hers from behind to be mildly concupiscent. 
She normally preferred her gentleman to not be so forward, however, and not quite to speak. Bark, bark, woof, bark, bark, woof, it said. The imp, the imp was gone. It had stopped translating his words, so it must not be translating hers either. That's why they couldn't understand each. The man's second arm joined the first, this time sliding up into her neck. The first hand then moved from below her bosom to her forehead, preventing her chin from guarding her throat. With a roll, he was beneath her now, with both of them facing the ceiling. His legs snaked around hers, holding them down. She pressed him tight against her throat, with his bleeding forearm and thick bicep, almost like a piece of wrought iron trying to remove her head. Her sight began flashing white again, this time starting at the edges. She could barely breathe as it was, but this was something else. An excruciating pressure built inside her skull. She was going to die in mere moments. Her soul would wander from star to star. She wanted to make peace with the Almighty in the last seconds. But she could only think of fighting. Fighting against this man-beast named Huben. Pointless. Sure, she was caught by surprise, but she honestly thought that she would have stood a better chance. Instead, she was little more than a stupid slashing dummy. Not even a proper sparring partner for him. Sparring. Sparring? She immediately stopped all fighting and went limp, slapped his arm on her throat three times. Her vision was fully white now, and she could not see. She could barely feel any of her body beyond the arm on her throat. Would it understand? This was just a translation problem, right? This man had to be intelligent, not a killer, or a monster, or a lunatic. Had to be. In her final fading moments, she slapped his arm slowly, firmly, deliberately, three more times. After the third time, something happened. She could barely tell that the pressure on her neck was gone and her body had been shifted gently to the floor. Something soft had been placed under her head. The gentleman was no longer pressed against her. Though blurred, her vision began to return. She stared at the ceiling and blinked tears from her eyes. Human was crouching above her. Bark! 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 Oof! Okay! It said. My name is Lady Aranus Karamast. She barely managed to whisper. Daughter of Lady Jerusalka, Dame Commander in her Imperial Majesty's Order of the Sacred God, and I am not an animal. Aranus's head fell to the side as she lost consciousness. End of story. When Death Wilders Meet, Part 9 She could see the stars, the blinding lights only visible on a cloudless night. She traveled to one and held it in her hand, a beautiful, crystalline, incandescent light. It shifted and twisted like the candle's flame in all directions at once. She watched it twinkle for a moment before releasing it. She flew to another and held it, too, examining it. It felt larger and softer, but like the other, she did not recognize it. Releasing it, the search for one that could show her spirit the way home. None of them looked the same, not from here. She could identify no constellations at all. Not the two suns, not the huntress, not the insect and the pauper. The land looked different from the mountaintop when one only ever stood in a valley. So it was when one looked at the stars while well amongst them. She found one that felt similar. One that just might be able to help lead a soul home to rest. Reaching out to touch it. Hey, hey, Aranus, don't you fall asleep on me. What? She squeaked when she saw the man leaning above her and tried to scooch away, only to be reminded that she was still backed into a corner. She needn't to have worried, it seemed. The large man looked concerned, apologetic even. His crumpled little nose and blood-stained lips made him seem even more sincere. Son of the Almighty, Aramis, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to kill me. If it's any consolation, I probably would have just choked you out. She rubbed her head and moaned. You did choke me out. Uh, yeah, uh, again, sorry about that. It's all right, she whispered with a half-hearted smile. She had offered him her hand, only to see him flinch. 
I won't hurt you again. You know my name, Tubby. What should I call a young gentleman such as yourself? Lieutenant Colonel Stephen McLaren, he said softly, placing his hand in hers. I'm not that young. She thought that she had known at least part of his name from when the vile warden had spoken, but apparently she was wrong. It seemed he wasn't called human after all. Of course, she wasn't called Night Beast either. She gently brought his hand to her lips and licked the back. She may have held on to it just a moment longer than courtesy allowed. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Stephen said, withdrawing his hand. Nice to meet you. I am honored and delighted to make your acquaintance, my gentleman, said Aranus, pushing herself into a seated position against the wall. Okay, so, um, you're not going to kill me, and I'm not going to kill you, right? Stephen asked. Aranus felt genuinely offended. I would never harm a gentleman, she said, literally turning her nose up at the notion. Well, um, my head and nose seem to disagree, said Stephen. The imp never gave inflection in its voice, but she could tell from his expression that the tone of Stephen's box that he was making sports of her. She risked a playful slap on his tummy. It felt oddly firm for a man. He didn't seem to mind, either. And there's this. Huh. Deeper than I thought. No wonder I'm still lightheaded. Stephen held up his right arm in front of her. Blood dripped from his elbow, freely landing warm and wet all over her thighs. She had cut him deeply, no doubt about it. Without thinking, she grabbed his arm tightly to close the slash wound and tore the remnants of a wool chemise from her chest. It was little more than a broad necklace at that point anyway. Stephen didn't pull away as she bound it. That's, um... He opened and closed his hands a few times, seeming satisfied. Pretty good. He turned to her and smiled. His mouth opened as if to say something, but silently gaped instead. She watched his eyes roam over her form from her top to her bottom. I didn't notice when we were fighting, but, um, you're naked, he said. Very naked. She glanced down, knowing her eyes couldn't tell her anything that she didn't already know. Slowly, almost defiantly, she moved her hand to cover her groin. All this time, she hadn't thought about it, but she'd been completely undressed. When they took her, she had awoken with almost all of her clothing gone. A small fortune in leathers and furs. Gone were her jerkin, trousers, and fur coat. She had been left with nothing but her undergarment. After a time, even that had been turned into bandages or simply washed to pieces. The last of which she had just given to this man without a second thought. She was as naked as any of the monsters here. She hadn't really been bothered about her duty until this very moment. Somehow, the presence of this odd man reminded her that the world hadn't been turned on its head. That civilization still reigned on the Almighty's earth. And she had at no point abrogated her need to comport herself in a proper and dignified manner. On the other hand, she was a tortured prisoner, lucky to be alive and in no position to be concerned with covering her shame when a mere survival should be her biggest concern. Shame on him! for pointing out something so trivial. I have nothing to be ashamed of, she replied indignantly. What's the matter? Have you never seen a woman before? I, um, well, uh, sorry, um, I just mean that, uh, hold on. He unclasped his tunic's long tooth faster that ran from the top of his neck to the midsection and stepped out of it. It looked to be clean, save for a bloody section on the right arm and made a remarkably fine construction. Underneath, he wore a set of soft-looking long underwear. My gentleman, you needn't disrobe to your undergarments on my behalf, she hissed, reaching out to stop him. She was in far too feeble of a condition to do much more than stall him. Had she been in perfect health, things might have been different. He shoved his tunic into her bosom. It smelled thickly of sweet blood, yes, but also sweat and musk. It was not an entirely unpleasant, but made her uncomfortably hungry. Here, take it, Stephen said. He shrugged, or oh, don't, but then you'll just distract me. The corners of her mouth began to creep up. She couldn't tell if he was joking or serious. Either way, 
it made her smile just a bit. She grimaced as she began putting the garment on, agony racking her entire body with each movement. He took note of the trouble that she was having and began to help her. To add to the indignity of losing in single combat to a man, and doing so wearing little more than what the Almighty gave her on the day that she was born, she was having to rely on him to dress her. Using one of her own claws to cut open the hems at the legs of his garment to better fit her larger feet. Sliding it on past her buttocks, he helped her arms inside, fastened it up, and patted the side softly. All set, he said. It could have been worse, she supposed. Pretending he was her personal servant made it a little easier, which she noted as she felt the fine fabric decorated with sigils and coats of arms was definitely not the case. This gentleman was nobody's servant. Have you a title? she asked him, admiring one of his sigils. I thought I heard mention of one. Um, like yours, uh, Dame Commander. Yes, from the inflection when you made the introductions, I gather that you are Stephen of House McLaren. I thought Lieutenant Colonel might be a title. The short answer is, uh, no, my lady, um, but how about we talk about that later, he said quietly. She followed his eyes as he looked from the speaking indentation in the wall and back to her. I have plenty of questions about this place, and I'm sure you may have some questions for me. Perhaps once we get out of here... She gave a curt nod. Of course, the warden was listening. Here, the expression was to be taken literally. The walls actually did have ears. Can you see in here? She asked. None of the others, the, the monsters can. You looked blind when you first got in here, and now you can see the hole where the warden speaks. Well, I can't see too well at all, he said. But when I got here, I couldn't see a thing. My eyes needed time to adjust. He leaned close, his body hovering just over hers. We are getting out of here, he whispered into her ear. How? She breathed into his much smaller one. We wait. We'll figure the rest out, he said. But I wouldn't worry. A soft sound came from the far wall, like metal on metal. Both her and Stephen turned to the noise. A small hatch, which she knew from experience to be an embrasure, had opened across the room. With all her remaining but not insignificant strength, she lunged for Stephen, grabbing him to about the midsection and pulling him to the ground next to her. In one swift motion, she climbed on top of him, lying flat, and did her best to cover as much of him as possible. Don't move, she hissed in his ear. Moments passed as not a single sound escaping between them from anywhere else. Why? he whispered back. She felt his hands move to her sides as if to move her off of him, but they remained in place. Confused, she shifted her gaze from side to side, then slowly turned her head to look up and behind them. The hatch had closed. Sorry, I thought they were going to loose arrows at us, she replied softly. She didn't immediately register that she should probably remove herself from the gentleman. She thought it as much as his own fault. He should have said something, but didn't, for whatever reason. When she did roll off of him, she felt a subtle but distinct loss. After so long with not a single kind interaction or touch from another living soul, it had actually felt nice. Stephen, whom she hadn't thought of as anything but her own countryman since she awoke, had just reminded her of what she'd been doing without. Not only that, but just having him with her in this confinement as someone of a similar mind and goals, someone to work with, gave her hope. Though a man, he even made her feel safe and secure. Don't do that again, he whispered. Chagrin and more than a little hurt, she was about to apologize and explain herself when he continued. You need to save your strength, he whispered. You're still hurt from our fight, and I can probably take an arrow better than you anyway. Aranus's present condition had little to do with a match with Stephen, from which the pain, breathing issues, and dizziness had largely remitted, had everything to do with her virtually depleted and generally unsatisfactory food supply. She was not recovering her spent energy nearly as fast as she should have been on top of the fact that she had been terribly weak to begin with. As for who should protect whom, he was still a man and his arm could attest to the fact that his skin could rebuff arrows no better than hers. 
She was about to contest both his absurd notions when she noticed something that hadn't been there a moment before. There's something on the step of the embrasure, she whispered into his ear, nodding in the direction. The what? he replied softly. The arrow slit, the hatch, she clarified. He followed her gaze, a questioning finger pointing towards the small concave fixture. She nodded. Standing, he appeared nonchalant as he approached the object, palmed it, and returned to her side, keeping her close between their chests. They examined it together. Roughly, as long as a breadth of a hand, and the object appeared to be a cylindrical container of some sort. Trying and opening and pressed on the lid, she extracted the contents, an unnaturally smooth piece of vellum, as long as the container, and rolled neatly to fit inside. At Verdigat, she could see a set of simple illustrations, like a child's hasty drawings. No, I don't get it, Stephen said. These are stick figures, two people. I can tell one is you and the other is me. What are these things? Arrows, the kind they use here, Aronus replied. She pointed to the third drawing where the, both their figures were stuck like game. Odd tubular arrows jutting out their backs. When they hit you, they put you to a deep sleep. Except, she examined the fourth drawing where the figures were on the ground and the arrows sticking out of them. Then a fifth where the arrows had been removed, but the figures were still on the ground. The sixth had twelve hash marks, time, she supposed. And in the seventh, the final illustration, the figures remained unmoved still. Except this time, they mean to kill us. She finished. End of chapter. When Death Will Does Meet, Part 10. Aranus tossed the vellum aside in disgust. Not that it mattered, but she wondered whether the message had been sent as a warning or a threat. We have to get out of here, she said, not even bothering to whisper. Or hide somewhere. Yeah. Definitely, agreed Stephen, looking to the cage. She had been afraid he'd get that idea. Well, it was most certainly true that she wasn't quite ready to introduce Stephen to a skeleton French just yet, for fear that he might take the wrong way. She had other, more silent concerns. For one, while the bars might afford some small measure of protection, forcing their assailants to more carefully aim their shots, it was far from perfect. As much as she had moved around in there, they had always found a way to hit her before. But that alone did not give her pause. Some protection, even just to temporarily confound the enemy, beat nothing any night of the week. No, she wasn't going back into that tiny cage for one simple reason. She couldn't bring herself to go back in there. Not after she'd spent an almighty knew how long alone inside that ossery. With no time, nor thoughts, nor company, hoping only for death to claim her and end the torment. Just thinking about it made her shake. I don't think it'll work, she said. We have to find something else. We'll find something else after we get some cover in there, he said, stepping inside the cage to examine it. She heard a cascade of crunching noises. That had to be Twinegard. Stephen's foot had gone right through his chest, smooshing some choice organs she'd been saving. What the shit, Aridus? He heard the man yell. Is this a god? It's like a slaughterhouse in here. She mentally shrugged. She doubted his feet were very clean, but she would be dead long before she worked up the courage to eat more of Twine's foul-tasting, rotting entrails anyway. Don't be mad at me, she said, indignant. You're the one who wasn't looking where he was going and ruined my supper. What a bust gentleman you are. Can't even see where your meat comes from. No. Oh, God, no. His voice barely above a whisper, his hand moving to cover his mouth and nose. He rolled Twine's head to the side, examining the skull cavity. One of his eyes fell out, though she had chewed most of his face away. She'd gone to great trouble to leave them in there, so he seemed more interested in what she had to say. I think, um, I think these were intelligent people. They made you eat them? Of course not, she said. I could have starved or played their little games, got some gruel, and as my reward, got to take a little longer to starve to death. But those lunatics, killing their own slaves just to feed you. S slaves? She cocked her head to the side, confused. You mentioned something about that before. Maybe, but I don't think so. 
One of them was perfectly content to torture me all on his own accord. He seemed like he was rather enjoying himself, actually. The other two were his friends. I think they were in the employ of the warden. Well, that makes it even worse, Stephen said. I wonder why anyone would work for a captain if he's that kind of guy too. He paused, looking down at the remnants of the three monsters, then back to her. She grinned wide, flashing her pearly white teeth at him. She felt quite proud of her perfect smile. The corners of Stephen's mouth curled up in response. Ah, I see. The captain didn't kill these people, he said in a flat tone. Of course he didn't. Why would he do that? I did, she said. They're monsters. They took me and tortured me. They deserved no less. Right, he said, nodding his head. And you ate them. Want some? She asked, sarcasm and humor laid on thick. I could prepare some wonderful sausage for you out of that one's intestines. That one's in it, and the third one's back fat. Season them with some slime mold, and it's supper foot for a queen. He appeared to be the opposite of amused. She sighed, seeing his revulsion had been genuine. I did it because I had to, my gentleman. Not because I wanted to, she explained carefully. It's true that I don't entirely see this as cannibalism, which I know you're thinking because thought crossed my mind too. The truth is, for whatever reason, I just can't seem to think of them as people, no matter what they say or how intelligent they seem. I cannot place myself as them, think as they would think, or feel ill for their illness. Do you understand? Hmm, yes, I understand. What about me? he asked. It hurts me deeply. Then I hurt you without cause, she said, rubbing her chest. I feel for you more than I would my own kin. And while I'm sure you would be absolutely delicious to eat, you're very clearly a person, so that would be cannibalism. Still best to be on guard around me, she finished, playfully snapping her jaws at him. He walked to her and crouched down in front of her. Without warning, he gently tapped her on the nose. Just you try it, he said with what must have been a smirk. He leaned over, scooping her into his arms. Embarrassed, she tried to help herself to her feet without him, but she was already standing with his assistance. No man from her people could have lifted her like that. Of course, no man she'd ever seen was as large as him either. What are you doing? she asked. They had nowhere to go except, First, we get you to your feet, he said. Then we walk into the cage for some... No, 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 she said, pushing away from him. I don't care how big you are. You're not going to get me in there. Not now. Not ever. He tried to urge her ever so gently into the cell. Come on, Aranus. We have to... No! She yelled into his face, her teeth narrowly missing everything from the furry patch above his left eye to the bottom of his chin. Shocked by what she'd almost done, she looked away. I'm sorry. It, that isn't me. I, I just can't go in there. If that means I die standing here, then please just let that happen. Not a problem. I think I understand, said Stephen. And I'm sorry for trying to make you do something you didn't want to do. What if we climbed on top of the cage instead? The bars beneath us should still offer some protection. I, uh, I could try that, she offered hopefully. But if we start and I don't want to anymore... Then we stop and find some other way to protect ourselves, he finished for her. She nodded with a smile. Help me over there, she said. She leaned heavily on the tall man, still uneasy on her feet. You're heavy. What do you eat, lad? Just kidding. I know what you eat, he joked with a smile, wrapping one arm around her waist and pulling her other over his opposite shoulder. His hand had tickled where he held her above her hip causing his stomach to tense. He took notice. That's why you must spend a lot of time in the weight room. Have you thought about switching to cardio? She was about to ask what that was, followed by asking what the next step was in the escape, when a loud cracking and whining noise startled her. It had it come from the voice indentation in the wall? Their time had just run out. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She cursed the warden for the thousandth time. The seven hells to the translators reactivate. Well, find out how before I send you to ask them, the warden's voice screamed, seemingly to neither she nor Stephen, but somebody entirely unseen. 
Perhaps that person was in the adjacent room with the warden from whence he spoke. Night Beast, you will slash the human until he bleeds out immediately, or I will personally administer your bath time every single day, all day, until your skin is flayed from your bones. Wide-eyed, she felt the human ship beside her. I will not hurt this gentleman again, she yelled, unsteadily splaying her claws and rising her pads to full height, almost a head taller than Stephen. And I swear upon my honor as her imperial majesty's dame commander, that I will personally carve your body and remove your head, in that order, with my bare feet. It was the first thing that she had said to any of the takers, but she had let that particular secret go when she had introduced herself to Stephen. So be it, said the warden. Two embrasures opened up on opposite sides of the room, followed immediately by a pair of loud pops. Stephen heard the sounds and knew instantly that the dark guns were poisoned arrows which Aranus had warned him of. At hearing the sound, he gave no thought to immediately pushing his companion away from him. She must have had the same idea, because when his hand met her shoulders, her hands met his chest. They didn't so much shove each other away as explode apart. Adrenaline was a hell of a drunk. It was far too late for either of them, he knew. He could feel his start jabbing into his back where he landed on top of it, painfully forcing it deeper beneath the skin. He could see her sticking out of her side, just at the level of what would be a kidney on a human. Against all odds, he saw her getting to her feet, staggering towards him. He marveled at her persistence and strength of will, pulling himself to a seated position to yank the barbed dart from his back. A few milliliters of viscous blue liquid remained inside, but the rest had clearly been injected into his body. He wondered how much time he had. He wondered how much time Aranus had. She staggered to the dazed halt in front of him. Like a puppet with all her strings cut, she fell on top of him, pressing him to the deck. End of chapter When Death Worlders Meet Part 11 Stephen reached out to catch Aranus as she fell, though there was only so much he could do from his reclined position against her dense weight. He collapsed under her, his back slamming against the floor. Her head landed next to his, so close that her open mouth practically surrounded the side of his face, a hot, humid breath of air buffeting his senses. Earlier, he would have estimated her weight to be around 75 kilos. Now, having collapsed while standing, she had felt at least twice that heavy. He couldn't move a muscle while pinned under her. He first tried to remove the dart from her side to get a better look at it, but he found that he could not. The moment he tried to move, he felt her fighting against him, her arm pressing down into his. You know the muscle, she whispered her long tongue licking his ear. His translator did its best as she tried to speak with her mouth gaping and awkwardly pressed against his head. He got the general idea. Clay, dead, clasp me. Without a second thought, Stephen went limp and closed his eyes. He felt her chest against him, slowly inhaling, then exhaling in a sigh of relief. They waited like that for seconds, then minutes. He was about to take a short nap, made more difficult by her weight and a high body temperature, when he heard the door to the cargo hold sliding open. He opened his eyes just the tiniest fraction to the bright light outside, enough to see several figures silhouetted. The first one, he could tell, was Ginter. The others, maybe four. He had no idea beyond the fact that they all looked to be holding some kind of rifle. He readied himself to hold Aranus in place in case she decided to attack without warning. Yes, it looks like the altered night beast serum I prepared has knocked them both out. He could hear the centauroid doctor loudly saying from the doorway, It's safe. You can move her into the cage. I'll wait right here. Stephen could feel Aranus salivating, the warm fluid starting to pull around his cheek and ear. He really wanted a Q-tip and maybe a small towel, 
and she really needed a breath mate, or twenty. One of Ginter's escorts shoved the doctor in her upper back with the butt of his rifle. Not good enough, veterinarian, the groomman replied. You know what the captain said. Your drugs, you get to go in first and make sure they're not cold. We'll wait here. With another prod, he could see the doctor slowly trotting towards Arinus and himself, her hooves softly clapping against the deck plate with each step. He readied himself to hold Aranus tight if he had to. It would not help any of them to have her disembowel the good doctor. To his immense relief, he felt only his companion's hot breath and what might have been a growl from her stomach, even as the doctor hovered over them, prodding them each with the turn of a hoof. Aranus made no move. Yes, my formulation has worked. They are definitely both out, the doctor said stepping back. You can move them now. I would hurry, though. The effects of the drug may not last long. This is the first time we've tried something like this on the human species. Look at her. Not so tough now, is she? asked one, stepping over to where they lay. Stephen could see Ginter by the doorway now, staring right at him and nodding her head up and down in an exaggerated motion. No, she's nothing, said another crewman, crouching down beside them. He poked Aranus in the side. Look at her. She tried to protect her boyfriend. Ah, too bad, the witch. As soon as we got back into your cage, he's getting plasma bolt to the head. Those two were joined by the two others, and still Aranus hadn't betrayed any sign of life beyond the rise and fall of her chest. He could feel her breathing faster and her heartbeat pounding into his chest, though. Beyond that, however... She didn't move a muscle as each alien took one of her appendages in hand, tentacle, or other grasping organ. He began to wonder if perhaps something had gone wrong with the plan that everyone but him knew about, if she had been paralyzed, and if he would have to be intervene. He had almost resolved to stop them from taking her into that cage when a head fell into his lap. He rolled to his feet just as the creature that looked like a praying mantis bred with a buffalo fell to the deck, its head separated from its body by a good two meters now. Something with tentacles began to bring its rifle to bear on Aranus, only for Stephen to smoothly pry it away. He shot it half a dozen times while Aranus landed just as many of her powerful kicks to the third groomer. It occurred to Stephen that she might have been going easy on him on their tussle. Very easy. With both hands, she held onto the being a half meter taller than her, while her hind legs kicked up into his abdomen and then slashed downwards. On the upswing, her legs operated like a kangaroo's might, stabbing into the alien with a dagger-like claws. On the downswing, her claws dug in deep, ripping and tearing and spilling blood guts and bone with each motion. It was like being on the receiving end of a massive, intelligent and angry reciprocating saw. When it looked like she was holding up to the being up by herself, all ability to stand on its own having departed with its life, she bit into its throat out of good measure. That only left the fourth crewman, who had backed himself away from the pair and made his way to the doorway. He held his rifle at the ready, taking turns aiming at Stephen, then at Aranus, as he carefully shuffle-stepped backwards. He was too scared to think rashly, Stephen rationalized, and had defaulted to trying to hold him in place. In moments, he would come into his senses and decide whether to fully commit to shooting or running. It was too late, though. The crewman had already made one fatal mistake. Situational Awareness Narrowness where her part had begun edging her way into the shadows and out of the swath of light cast by the open doorway. In front of her, she held the remaining upper half of the last crewman that she had killed, its entrails still spilling out, ostensibly as protection from the plasma rifle. It was equally as likely that she was just a nervous eater as she continued to bite off chunks from her kill and swallow as she apprehensively eyed the gunman. Stephen had begun to consider dropping his weapon and storing for time when, uh, for the second time that day, a head hit him in the stomach, or rather, most of a head. The blow hadn't been nearly as clean as the one of Aranus's slashes. 
Ginter's hind legs landed with an echoing thud and a bloody hoof prints. She then turned back around to face the pair. Let's go, she shouted. End of chapter. When Death Will Is Meet, Part 12 Stephen stepped around the fourth and final crewman, a crumple and bloody heap thanks to Ginter's devastating mule kick. She was the biggest creature on the ship, but that wasn't saying much when almost everyone else aboard was one half or double his height. He suspected that many of the inhabitants aboard were from low-gravity worlds, and that had something to do with it. Even after having spent so long at zero-g, this place still made him feel unnaturally light at his feet. At around 155 centimeters at her middle shoulders, Ginter's lower profile appeared similar to a full-grown buck reindeer. From her middle shoulders to her upper shoulders, she might have been an androgynous human of average adult size. Her head could be compared to that of a mule deer with a forehead, with a six horns and a place of antlers. She sported a short coat of fur over every millimeter of her body, with small, fine hairs as a lower layer, and longer, coarse hairs as an upper layer. Her coloration ran a gamut from light brown to dark brown, interspersed with darker spots and fading to a tannish white at her chest. Underside, Andrea. She, like everyone but he and Aranus, wore no clothes, nor a hint of clothes. Instead, she opted to wear a very human-like backpack on her upper half and pocketed harness in the lower half. Unlike when he had noticed his predator friend on her torn undershirt, the doctor very clearly intended to be naked. It looked appropriate, actually, given the fur already providing her with a sufficient coverage. He almost felt like one needed to have a bare skin to even have the option of being in the nude. Glad to see you again, doctor, said Stephen, patting her lower shoulder as he hurried from the cargo hold into the adjoining corridor. It was then that he noticed Aranus had yet to follow. He turned back to find her crouched in the shadows of the open hold, still holding onto the corpse of her assailant. I need a moment, she said. It's too bright to see out there. My eyes will need some time to adjust. Okay, we'll wait then, Stephen replied with a nod. We don't have that kind of time, said Ginter. Maybe a minute or two to get the command deck. Tops. It's only a deck, and Tuktun won't expose to the vacuum to kill us. Stephen helped his crouching companion to her feet. I'll guide you until you can see, he said. No, my gentleman, that'll only slow you down. I'm on my back, called Ginter. Now! Are you sure, physician? Aranus asked weakly, getting to her feet. I did not think most creatures could have... Yes, move it! Aranus indicated her most recent meal. May I bring my new friend? For the love of... Yes, just keep eating, damn it. But oh, oh, we have to move. Before the doctor had finished speaking, Aranus had leapt onto her lower horizontal back with a new friend still in hand. As they ran together, Stephen heard his companion talking to the rescuer. Thank you for the instructions, Aranus said. We didn't know what they meant at first, but we figured it out in short order. In truth, Stephen hadn't figured out a damn thing. Aranus must have known that there was nothing in the darts from the moment they hit. She had experience with them after all. As for them being filled with a lethal concoction, he supposed it hadn't taken her long to figure it out either. Without his companion, he would have spent a good ten minutes looking for a way to counteract the non-existent poison. He should have known that this is all just part of the doctor's plan. He had a pretty good guess that she had also been responsible for turning back on the translators. He hadn't even realized that they'd been deactivated until the night beast started talking. And thank you for not eating me, the doctor replied. I wasn't sure you would know we're all of the same side. I wanted to kill you at first, Aranus said with a shrug and you made it clear that you had been prepared to faulty sleep elixir. Why help us, though, aside from the obvious? There is no aside, said the other woman. I am a slave here, and I would rather not be. As for the rest, 
She asked me for help when I was brought on board and examined, interrupted Stephen. I knew immediately that you'd be able to help, Ginter said to him before turning her attention to the woman riding on her back. If you want, you can throw your leftovers off me. They're leaking onto my fur. I brought Stephen's meat rations for you. They're in my pack. Now consider it of you, physician, the other woman said, rooting through her pack, retrieving one of the entrees that he'd set aside in his cell. It was a beef brisket, and he was very jealous. She didn't, he noticed, drop her half-finished crewman. The doctor pointed to the open doorway ahead of them and to the left. Here, up this ramp, next level. A thought occurred to him. Doc, um, they've got to stop by the cells amidship. No, there isn't time, Stephen, she said. Bull crap, he said. We have to try. What about your oath, doctor? To whom? She huffed. Holding on to the doctor with her arms around her chest, Aranus leaned over to the other woman's upper shoulders. I would be regarded as a stain on my order if we didn't try free those people, she growled. You are guilty of cowardice, alchemist, if you fail to aid them. Do you know what that means? It means that we're going to free them, Ginta said with a sigh. Idiots, the both of you. This way. They started up the ramp and exited onto the third deck, where the slave quarters were located. Stephen hadn't seen this part of the ship on his tour, but recognized a prison when he saw one. At the far end, a group of crewmen were already releasing the last of the slaves from their cells. It wasn't often that the enemy did his job for him, but he wouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. He saw the two crew pointing their rifles at the slaves now pouring into the hallway. Kill those three and you'll all go free, one of them cried. Ah, that's why, mumbled Stephen. They don't know who you are, said Ginter. They won't know what the two are capable of. Please don't hurt them. We? I don't think we have much of a choice, said Stephen, charging behind the cover of the cell's door frame. He aimed his rival at the one of the armed slavers and pulled the trigger. It fell, a large smoking hole appearing in the chest before it topped out of sight. With some consternation, he noted that killing the crewman had done nothing to quell the charging mob. He tried killing another one and succeeded just as easily. He briefly considered that his enemies were unusually slow, even allowing for the normal dilating perception of time in combat. They were slow to move, slow to draw a bead on him, and slow to react. He heard a deafening sound, something between a lion's roar and what Hollywood said a velociraptor sounded like. From the corner of his eye, he saw the source, Aaron standing at a full height on Ginter's lower back, a hand on the centroid's head to stabilize herself. With her other, she tightly held the crewman meal by its dangling spinal column. Everyone paused in their tracks at the harsh war cry. All eyes were on Dame Commander. Stephen took the opportunity to shoot another armed crewman in the stomach. I am the night beast, Aranus screamed, throwing the corpse hard. It soared down the hall with such a force that when it hit the ground, it burst into a splatter shower of vital fluids, bone, and gore. You will leave this place now, or I will kill every last one of you. Now that had routed the charging slave mob. To the escape pods, Stephen added. Uh, go that way. Aranus looked at him and cocked an eyebrow. He shrugged. So did she. Neither she had no idea what an escape pod was, which was more than likely, or she didn't appreciate him ruining her moment. More both. The man made a mental note and sent the distress signal for the pods, or release a nav buoy, or otherwise let someone know where they were. Aranus's ploy that really wasn't a ploy at all had worked perfectly. The mob of slaves and a handful of remaining crewmen had dispersed in every single direction, but the one that would take them near him and his companions. He had to admit, she was quite intimidating. In the dark of that hole, just after their rescue, while chewing on a half a crewman, she was genuinely terrifying. In the abstract, 
she was a lot like the worst alien space horrors that cinema had to offer. It was more than just a bearing in behavior, as his arm could attest. And he had booped her snoot, daring her to eat him. Her vision must have adjusted sufficiently, and her strength returned, as she wasted no further time in jumping down from Ginter's back and joining him at the other woman's side. Two more decks till we're safe, the Deertar said. End of chapter. When Death Will This Meet, Part 13 The three of them ran at a dead sprint up the next spiraling ramp and into the long hallway very similar to the one below. Along each side were rooms stacked with bunks and lockers. Personal effects were evident, along with what might have been game pieces or playing cards on tables. So far, they had been lucky. Nor the crewman had been lucky. He wasn't sure which at this point. None of them had been occupied. That changed when they made their way into the large open section. It looked like some sort of large multi-purpose room with tables and chairs of all varieties in evidence, along with hollow projectors, bit screens, and quite a few other pieces of equipment whose function he could only just guess at. The room looked like it could have been used for anything from dining to entertainment, to relaxing to exercising to just about anything a crewman a long way from home might want. At the moment, there sat three groups around a half a dozen crewmen each, lounging on what looked like an old Roman cane. He might have let them live, had they not moved a muscle. But no, not after he noticed that they were being served and serviced by at least a dozen slaves. A calmness came over him, and he gave a mental shrug. Maybe Aranus was right, but it certainly didn't take much for him to stop seeing these creatures as people. He raised his rifle in a chorus of wide-eyed shouts, whoops, and screams from all present. They began preparing to scatter like roaches. No one move, he bellowed, and everyone in the room froze in place. He scanned the room, ready to punch neat little superheated holes in anyone who even looked like they might try to go for their weapons or resist. By all rights, he should have started shooting well before he opened his mouth. That would have been the tactically sound approach. But no, he had something better in mind for these scum. He turned to the NASA jumpsuit-clad woman at his side. She was at least as angry as he was at this point, maybe more so. Chivalry being what it was, he had an idea not to use Aranus, so much as harness her into providing something so much more deserving than a simple death. My lady, he said, my delicate masculine sensibilities have been gravely offended. Would you mind killing everyone who is presently sitting on one of those chairs? Adley, my gentleman, she replied with a snarl. He could see her preparing to bounce in the corner of his eye when one of the slavers, looking from Stephen to Aranus and back again, decided to beg for his life. Apparently, it had heard what he had said. Wait, the creature shouted, pushing a slave off its lap. He stood up and addressed Aranus. I'm a male too, and you wouldn't hurt an unarmed man, would you? I might, she responded. Stephen could tell that she was generally mulling it over. He knew that she was used to killing in the heat of battle, or in desperation. But this was something different, even if deserved. Add to that the fairly obvious fact that her society, and more than likely her entire species, was deeply matriarchal, and these sorts of executions posed a somewhat of a challenge to her culture and trading. Fine, said Stephen pointing his rifle at the creature's head. I'll do it. Single combat, the being shouted, his hands moving to cover his face from the inevitable plasma vault. I demand to face my attacker in single combat. No weapons, me and him. He heard Aranus let a small puff of air escape her lips. He doubted that there was much that she could say to that. Would she think less of him if he just shot the slaver? Probably. On the other hand, the thing looked like something out of a horror film on stilts. He couldn't even begin to count the number of legs. His choices were either to try and impress the violent alien super predator by fighting a living nightmare twice his height, or to chicken out and shoot the damn thing. Ginter must have known his hesitation meant that he was actually considering doing anything other than putting a hole in the crewman's thorax from a safe distance. Don't be stupid, be stupid, she said. We don't have the time for this. Just shoot them all. Let's go. 
Stephen handed off his rifle to the doctor. If anyone tries to interfere, we'll make a run for it. Then you use this, he said. She took the weapon and held it deftly. Stephen stepped to Aranus and pulled the young woman in for a hug. He felt her chest expand and contract in a sigh. Be safe, she whispered. He leaned in, giving her cheek a quick little lick. For luck, he said. For a moment she seemed stunned, not knowing what to say. She appeared to shrug, as if to stretch. She first brought herself up to her full height on the very pads of her feet, standing maybe ten centimeters taller than Stephen, then lowered herself down to his eye level. Leaning in, she held him tight and licked him firmly and square across the lips. For luck, she said, letting him go. Stephen turned to face the nightmare spider crab crewman and started walking. You can do it, my gentleman, called Aranus as Stephen stalked his way up to the mass of monstrosity. I believe in you. Idiots, the both of you. Such unnecessary drama, she said, shaking her head in disgust, getting ourselves worked up over nothing when we should be heading to the command deck. Stephen's just going to tear him in half anyway. He heard both of his companions' votes of confidence and felt his chest swell with pride. He would need every bit of it. He wasn't sure that this was a good idea. He should just grab Aranus and run. But no, here he was, risking everyone's knife because it was supposedly the right thing to do. At least all the slaves were escaping, so it was a win at the end of the day. As he approached the looming spider crab beast, he began considering his attack plan. Should he make a grab for one of the legs or try and dodge them? Should he keep his distance and remain mobile or close the distance and grapple? Was the thing venomous? How strong was it? How fast was it? Come at me, creature, said the spider crab crewman. Class 12? Ha! <laughs> Suck my ovipositor. Hey, um, wait a minute, said Stephen. Ovipositor? You're not a... The thing swiped for Stephen with a long pincer, and the man had an answer for the question of speed. Not very fast at all. He dodged easily, lunging forward beneath the creature so its central body loomed above him. He jumped into an uppercut. That's when the world went dark as it slammed down onto him. With a multi-limbed monster now pressing down, blocking his senses, and both of them sprawled out on the deck together, a bout of hysterical arachnophobia struck Stephen. He lashed out with both hands and feet, swinging madly as he tried to force the spindly crewman off him. He barely registered that everything around him had begun to get warm and slimy, and his opponent had indeed started its retreat, as he had hoped, albeit one piece at a time. Finally, he managed to find his footing beneath him, daggering and gasping. Where is it? he demanded of no one in particular. All around you, you lunatic, said the doctor, honestly. You're the most deadly being in the known universe that isn't another human, whether you want to admit it to yourself or not. You could have just slapped it dead. Stephen was soaked from head to toe in alien gore from the being that had been talking to him not five seconds ago. His thermal underwear had offered approximately zero protection from alien guts. Looking down at his feet, he could see that if anything, the doctor had understated his abilities. The spider thing wasn't torn in half so much as lumped into an odd collection of piles. He felt like throwing up. He tried his best, scolded Aranus. These monsters can be scary. There's no shame in that. Stephen wiped the blood and chitin fragments from his eyes. He noticed Ginter cradling his rifle expertly, thinking perhaps that more weapons was better than not. He reached for the one that had been next to where the spider crab had been lounging. Fact this, no more single combat. Keep that gun, Doc. Things might get hairy. Just as he lifted up the lightweight weapon into his hands, the room went mad. Apparently telling the crewman he and his friends were going to kill them all was a great way to make sure that none of them stayed put long enough for them to actually make that happen. He sighed internally. He hadn't wanted to take prisoners, certainly not after seeing how they used their slaves. But he also wanted to put a good face on humanity after all this mess came to light. That meant that he probably shouldn't kill those who were willing to surrender. As for opting to flee, though a little distasteful, shooting a retreating combatant in the back wasn't a war crime. They could be reasonably expected to return to the fight otherwise, more likely with a greater tactical advantage. Slavers, you run, you die. 
He shouted at the top of his lungs, You surrender, you live. It went without saying that if they fought back, that they would probably also die. Harry, take the ones running. I'll shoot the ones going for weapons, he called, hoping that she would remember which ones were slaves and which ones were slavers. Ginter, help me lay down some cover fire. Don't shoot near our girl. Aranus, for her part, didn't even notice as Stephen cut down with hot plasma the ones trying to shoot at her. She simply kept slicing into the bodies crowding the far doorway. In his adrenaline-fueled hyper-aware state, he wondered why on earth the most of these ones behind cover would risk being gunned down by Ginter and himself in order to shoot Aranus, who was busily fixated on tearing her way through those trying to flee. He could probably guess. She was meters from those hunkered down, far closer to them than Stephen, and while he and Ginter were just another pair of combatants, she was so much more, knee-deep in the remains of the fleeing crewmen, already down to the last view. She seemed like a dark, shifting mass of terror, made of lightning-quick teeth and claws, a roaring demon from nightmares made real. To them, Stephen was just a small mortal with a gun, but her, she was a dark angel of death ascended from the depths of hell itself. It irked Stephen that they thought so little of him as he shot yet another through the side of their head. It also scared him a little. If he couldn't pin these guys down because they couldn't be bothered to pay attention to the man shooting a weapon at them, it put his partner at serious risk. In what was at this point a truly unsurprising amount of time, the entire matter became moot. After decapitating the last of the escaping crewmen, Aranus spared not a single instant before leaping on the first of the trio of the slavers who had neither attempted to flee, surrender, nor had been shot by Stephen. In the light gravity, the young woman launched like a rocket from the doorway, giving the lieutenant colonel and the doctor precious little notice to shift their fire away so that they would not commit fratricide. In as many seconds Aranus had leapt to each of the three crewmen, having neatly sliced through their largest and mostly centered areas of mass, in one case practically bisecting him, or her, all the way through. Stephen guessed that at this point her speed wasn't so much due to the train deficiency of a killer, but the fact that she'd stopped taking the time to eat. She probably had her full, just wasn't hungry anymore, judging by the slight bulge of her previously lean tummy, evident even beneath his sprite suit. Fine, good, we're done here, said Ginter, trotting to the doorway at the end of the room. Stephen in tow. She pointed back to the way they had come and spoke loudly. Escape pods are that way. If you are alive, you should consider yourself free to get the hell out of the ship before you die with the rest of us. Shit, let's get going. Stephen had felt a slight and disquieting breeze of cold air in the spaceship. A moment later, he heard the hissing. He broke into a run, heading for the last ramp that would take them to the command deck. His accomplices just behind. He must have been holding out hope that the firefight would have stopped us. Not enough time. Not enough time, Ginter. Can we block these vents? No, said the doctor. Not all of them. The air will be long gone before we finish seeding the vents on this deck, let alone every deck. And we'd need to do that because the captain will have locked every door open as sure as he'd have locked the command deck closed. As if he needed some proof of her words, the trio rounded the curving ramp only to run face first into a completely sealed doorway. Seeing no way to lift or pry the smooth white surface and nothing in the way of a handle or anything else to grab a hold of, Stephen settled a banging on it. What about we just head to one of the escape pods, he asked. What are the chances we survive? Ginter made a gesture that Stephen's translator said meant negative. Even if we made it there without suffocating, she said quickly, we can't leave the slavers in command of the harvester. They'll just collect the floating pots and tow them to their home system or shoot them out of the void. Whichever. Fine! We bust the door. Stephen, said Quinta, grabbing his shoulder and rubbing a thumb over his collarbone. We are strong, but this is a waste of time. We need a better plan. It's an interior spaceship door. It only needs to withstand 15 psi, 20 tops. And it's not just me doing the kicking, he said, returning the gesture by pressing his hand into hers with withers of rubbing his thumb over the muscles there. 
You're stronger than you know, Ginter. You kicked someone's head off just a pair of minutes ago and carried Aranus like a war horse riding you to battle. I think between all three of us, we can do this. She looked livid, almost like he had offended her. Damn you to hell, Stephen. We will talk about that later. But that does not mean we can do this. I am is running out, shouted Aranus, grabbing the doctor by the head and turning the other woman to face her. She stared daggers into her eyes. You will help us now, like the ancestor's damned beast of a burden, and kick that damned door down, or I'll tear your heart out and let your soul rot adrift amongst the stars for all eternity. Stephen placed a gentle hand on the back of the enraged woman's neck and coaxed her to one side of the door, pointing at it. Aranus nodded. He stood in the middle of the doorway before nodding to Ginter. You're on that side, where I think it probably latches. I can't aim with two hooves, she said. Hitting that man in the head was just a lucky shot. Then use one, he said. Ready? Now. Stephen and Aranus fell flat on their faces, each trying to grab a hole or the other to brace their fall. They both ended up on the ground and an ungainly tangle of each other's limbs, with Stephen wondering just what in the hell happened. Neither of their kicks had made contact with anything. He was sure of it. Looking around, the man realized that they were both lying on the floor of the command deck, just across the entranceway that they had been on the opposite side of an instant ago. The door itself was nowhere to be seen, leaving him to conclude that it had slid into a recess and admitted them. Ginter, having had the benefit of owning a total of four legs and only using one to kick, remained standing. She gave them the equivalent of a shrug as he and Aranus delicately untangled themselves from each other and got to their feet. You are going to break down the door anyway, called the captain. Even Stephen could tell from the man's natural voice that he had to be somewhere on the expensive deck, as opposed to speaking from a distant location via intercom. He could tell that the slaver had to be... Don't shoot, I'm unarmed, said the captain, stepping out from behind one of the command consoles. Stephen trained his weapon on the man, as did Ginter. The captain held his hands spread wide apart, empty palms facing forward. Even if that had been the universal gesture for feck you, Stephen could still tell the man had nothing at all, dangerous or otherwise. Behind the man, another slaver whom Stephen recognized, Mashy, the executive officer, made his way out from hiding, his tentacles spread wide. He too held nothing in his gasping appendages. You're surrendering, Stephen asked in disbelief, just like that. The captain made the equivalent of a shrug. You literally tore through my entire crew, yes. I'm sorry, but I think that this creature is tricking us, said Aranus, bounding gently on her toes. Stephen wondered what that meant. Nervousness, indecision, and another context that might have been cute. I wanted to kill you all, and Tuktun said. I would have simply opened fire as soon as I opened the hatch, not set up as an elaborate trap. But I don't know. I don't like this either, Aranus. Stephen saw nothing out of the ordinary. That could mean nothing. I'm begging of you, said the captain. Spare us. We mean you no further harm. This ship is yours now, Captain Human. This is no trick, just a conclusion that being at your mercy will keep us alive longer than shooting at you will. You killed a fully armed crew. You had inside help from that treacherous doctor. You could tear this ship apart with your bare hands, and that is no hyperbole. History has shown that even a death world or board a starship will kill everyone, let alone three. I'm merely bowing to the odds. Aranus growled. Stephen could tell that she didn't like this turn of developments. After what she'd been through, the temptation to gut him must be overwhelming, though equally conflicting with a sense of honor. Of course, he wouldn't dream of stopping her if she simply lost control. The lieutenant colonel held his weapon a little tighter, but pointed it down to the ground. Aranus had still not made a move. The earlier threats to personally disembowel him and devour his flesh notwithstanding. Ginter, he noticed, had curiously raised her weapon to point it at the captain, and she had just flipped the safety off. Whoa, 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 whoa! He slapped his hand against the barrel of her rifle, pushing it to the side. It took a surprising amount of force to get her point of aim to shift it away from the captain. The doctor began to struggle against Stephen, but made little headway until she began sidestepping into him with her haunches, simply pushing him aside with a balk. 
Ginter made a whining plane of noise as she continued to try her best to wrestle the weapon back on target. He knows, Stephen. He must die. Keeping an eye on Anticton and Marshy, the lieutenant colonel opted to stop pushing the rifle away and instead simply pulled it free from her grasp and threw it to the side. The two slavers had not made a move for any concealed weapons or tried to activate any device or explosive. That had been their best opportunity to spring a trap, and they hadn't done anything. Perhaps he should give them the benefit of the doubt. At the moment, however, he wanted to know just what the hell had gotten into the doctor, and so did Aranus. Physician, she asked, I agree with the warden deserves death, but he is surrendering. To my people, and I think to Stevens as well, it is considered rude to kill someone in such a circumstance. Only an appointed magistrate or a lady may pronounce his death now, said Aranus. She gave Stephen a conspiratorial eye. Or um, a ship's captain, though I'm curious, what does he know exactly that you believe that he must die for? Ginter grunted. Stephen wanted to know the answer to that question as well. He thought back to a few minutes ago, just before he and Aranus had less than gracefully made their entrance onto the command deck. Though he hadn't really known her for very long, that was the only other time that he'd seen Ginter nearly this upset. Almost like a switch had been flipped. It had happened just after he'd mentioned how strong she was. Deathworlders, Stephen said to Anticton. You called us Deathworlders. You also said it before, just after you locked me in that room with Aranus. Is that something significant? A word for races that are stronger than the wet tissue paper the rest of you seem to be made of. Exactly, said Anticton. It is a compliment, really. We would all love to be able to tear someone's head off as easily as opening a beverage, wouldn't we? Ginter doesn't seem to like being called that, said Stephen. A spy and a traitor, the former captain gave a shrug of equivalence. Her type doesn't like the truth, doesn't like being uh, found out. What do you mean? asked Stephen. The captain gave a knowing smirk. Ask her if she doesn't want to come clean. I'm asking you, growled Stephen. Ginter looked like she might charge the man. Aranus kept her hand on the other woman's back, but Stephen had serious reservations about how much good that would do, beyond giving Aranus a very short ride to the middle of a bloodbath. Anticton made a gesture of equivalent to rolling his eyes. The veterinarian isn't from Vree, a class three world. She probably isn't even Chakoth. She's from the death world like you and Lady Aranus of Karamast. Could also be some kind of engineered soldier, but I doubt it. She hardly seems the type. So what? said Stephen. Is this some kind of obscure space politics? What does it matter what world she's from? I don't understand. Oh, of course you don't, whispered the doctor. And that's why I like you, and Aranus. It doesn't matter to you and your kind, but to the rest of the galaxy, it does. We, um, the three of us, are from worlds that aren't supposed to harbor sapiens. If you ask them, we pose a serious risk to all other life in the galaxy. That is how you are able to tear the Tuskrook to pieces, how Aranus was able to kill an entire ship with the bare hands, and how I was able to carry her on my back and kick that man's head off. That's what gave me away, I imagined. Why would you want to hide that? Stephen asked. It seems like something I would want to let other people know about me. If they knew that, they might not even have taken you into slavery. Even as he said it, he realized an obvious conclusion. She wanted to be taken. Or at least, it was better than some alternative she faced. Because Stephen... The powers that be in the galaxy, as much as they don't like to admit that death will even exist, have a policy to address us, should they ever find us. 100% quarantine until the race reaches independent extrasolar flight. Then it's extermination, probably by something as simple as lobbing a few asteroids our way. There is evidence that this has happened before. Conspiracy theories. Why have plans to destroy species that don't even exist? Yelled the former captain. You're not going to listen to that wacky job, are you? As opposed to the abusive slaver pleading for his life? Asked Aranus. Why bother waiting for us to become spacefaring? Asked Stephen, entertaining her suggestion. Because most races, death wilder or not, end up destroying themselves anyway. It is just a byproduct of civilization. 
All life is competitive, carnivorous or not. Radiological weapons, heat death, pollution, engineered disease, all have killed worlds. Aeons ago, a civilization even created a vast satellite swarms around the sun to reduce power, with each political faction producing and controlling their own set. They ended up weaponizing them. They're still active today, and the planet is mostly in accretion disk now. Suicide is more convenient than murder, even on a planetary scale. And your people are spacefaring? asked Stephen. Yes, and yours are too, now said Ginter. That gave him pause, though it was a natural instinct. He was suddenly very glad that he hadn't provided any information to the slavers. How did the captain not know who or what you were? asked Aranus. He certainly thought I was dangerous, and one could summarize that it did not take him long at all to reach the same conclusion for Stephen. How were you able to hide? And if you were not unawares of this great community of daemons and their machinations concerning our kind, why did you allow them to take you? Ginter huffed. Stephen's translator told him that it was a sigh. I might as well tell you in front of them. The captain knows enough now that the wrong people can piece together the rest of his starts talking. I am a Sholkoth, and not engineered either. Not artificially, anyway. You colonized a death world, interrupted the captain. Shut your face, or I will remove it, Arana shouted back. When the Sholkoths were first leaving Vri millennia ago, we did so in a corporate-sponsored generation ships. A few natural disasters, war, man-made catastrophes, and time meant that more than a few were lost to the homeworld. Garakthkoth, my planet, is almost as deadly as either of your worlds. We knew of the gravity, atmosphere, and weather before we left Re, so we had generations to accommodate. But our history tells us that most were lost in the years after landfall. Maybe up to nine out of every ten people. But we persevere, and I'm a descendant of that lineage. She shook her head slowly, looking to the ground. When she spoke again, it was barely a whisper, a hiss of disgust through clenched teeth. Imagine our surprise when we finally began exploring the stars again. When our investigations on other worlds, dead worlds, informed us of our dedication to survival and marked us for extermination... Imagine my surprise when one of my farming outposts was raided by slavers, the fishermen of the galactic economy. I played the Vreen rather than expose my civilization to death. She gestured to the former captain. That man traded a pair of sublight engines to get me. I would have lived like that, forever a pathetic Vreen slave, if I had to, if I couldn't find a way to escape. Then you came. Then... They found you, Stephen. Your race had no more time. I couldn't let them do to you what we had seen them do to other worlds. That's why you helped me, said Stephen. Why you told me what these guys were about back when I was first brought aboard. Thank you. And that's why I would do anything to ensure knowledge of my people's existence doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Just knowing that a Shulkoth death world exists would be enough to send people looking for it, she said. I have to admit, I was a bit disappointed in you, Stephen. Why? Stephen asked. You're too nice, she said. I was kind of expecting you to begin a rampage with me a lot sooner and not get tricked into the cargo hold. For the sake of your people, I needed you to make a move before we made landfall at a slaver outpost. Before anyone else might see what you could do, and draw some conclusion. I was feeling him out. I was going to escape, but I am not going to start a fight on just the word of one person. Especially when these guys are so big and... Stephen paused, scratching the side of his face. Yeah, I think I just figured out where you're going with this. What? Aranus asked. I feel like I'm missing something important. He instigated this, you dumb beast, said Antictun, gesturing to the centaur root. She told me Stephen was a death welder, or pointed me at the right direction, which amounts to the same thing. She wanted me to try and kill him. You too should feel betrayed. So you put the gentleman in the dungeon with me and opened my cell. I suppose I should thank you, said Aranus with a slight bow at the waist. As much as I hate being used, you made the right call, said Stephen. I'm not sure that I would have attempted my escape in time, even if they'd spaced me then and there. It was the right call. 
Spaced? asked Aranus. Stephen had forgotten that many of these concepts were totally new to the young woman, although she was deceptively quick learner. Left my body adrift amongst the stars, he clarified. And how exactly is that a good decision? Aranus asked Ginter with a slight growl and an accusatory stare. No ship of his own, no body, no evidence at all, barely an inkling of where he might have come from, said the doctor. It would have bought his race time. It's better than Stephen waiting until it's too late to make his move. And it was also the least plausible outcome. Stephen wouldn't be dumb enough to walk into an airlock, and any weapon that won't put a hole right through the ship's hull won't permanently injure us. I thought Stephen fighting his way to control the ship was a very good bet. Getting himself locked in a room with what I took for a vicious predator. No offense, Aranus. None taken, physician, said the other woman. Was very much not part of my plan. I had to improvise, so kudos to you for keeping me on my feet. Former captain and Tickton. So, Stephen, could I please have the weapon so I can kill this pile of crap? Stephen spared a glance back to the weapon that he'd thrown from the woman's arms, then back at the slavers. He licked his lips, mulling it over. Ah, well, uh, that would be one way to handle the situation, but, um... No, Captain, she said, placing a gentle hand on his shoulder, rubbing his collarbone with a thumb again. It's the only way. It's the only way to keep us, our kind, safe from the galaxy. You must understand that. He felt a strong discomfort creeping up on him. Between this woman's touch, the closeness of her imposing bulk, and the strength he had seen in those legs, he began a mental rundown of whether or not it was a good idea to punch a rampaging horse. It is possible to imprison them on one of our worlds, Stephen said. We can inform our peoples of the situation and let them handle it. The abductions occurred in their territory. They have jurisdiction. So do you, Captain, she whispered. Ginter's hand tightening almost imperceptibly on his shoulder. We vote, physician, said Aranus. Then we will abide by the captain's decision. Ginter turned to the other woman, appearing annoyed. Fine, she said. I vote they stand before a magistrate, said Aranus. I vote to kill them, said Ginter. And I vote that they also stand trial, said Stephen. So be it, hissed the doctor. Stephen handed his weapon to Aranus before marching over to the pair of slavers. Grabbing them each by an appendage, they were surprisingly soft. Stephen asked, looking to one of the speakers embedded in the bulkheads. He'd seen the other slavers doing much the same thing before the escape. Do you respond to me now? Yes, Stephen, you are the captain, came the digitized reply in English. The former captain ceded a command to you at 4681.93.62.13 in the afternoon. He dragged the pair into the command deck's airlock and slapped the control for the inner hatch. The former captain began to protest. What are you? He shoved them roughly inside and slapped the control again to shut the door. Ginter looked pleasantly surprised. She had the wrong idea. He just didn't want them to have any clue where they were going until they got there. It was a space equivalent of tossing them in the trunk of a ground car, he imagined. Do not open the inner or outer door in this airlock to anyone but me, he said. Now can you find the location of my homeworld using the location you found me, the distance I traveled, if provided, and the direction I was traveling relative to the galactic center? Yes, but that will not be necessary, said the ship. I have determined that you are from RGT 9873A-3, an uninhabitable Class 12 death world. All right, said Corswell. Wait, Ginter said. I changed my vote, what? It's too late, said Stephen, and it wouldn't matter anyway. Yes, it does, and no, it's not, she quickly replied, pointing at Aranus. I also want to see him before a magistrate on her world. Stephen stared at her for a moment, then shrugged. Justice is justice. They have claim too, don't they? Both Ginter and Arasest nodded. Ship, do you know where Aranus' home is? Of course, came the reply. Good, said Corson Go, he said, pointing at the view screen. As space warped outside the ship, Aranus moved to stand close. He put an arm around her and felt very gratified when she returned the gesture, kneading her hand into his side. I'm finally going home, she whispered to him. Yeah, he whispered back, placing a kiss on the side of her head. He wasn't sure she knew what the gesture meant, but she sure didn't mind. 
It's our version of affectionate licking, he said. Thank you, Stephen, she replied, kissing his cheek and returned. Hey, um, Baroness, he whispered. Yeah, she whispered back. What's the penalty for kidnapping one of the Imperial Majesty Dame Commanders? He asked. Oh, if they're found guilty, death, she replied. Probably torture first, then definitely a painful death. Lots of torture, though. He glanced behind him long enough to see Ginter smirking. Stephen felt something large and painful land on his back, knocking the air out of him. It felt like a piece of furniture or a stack of books, or more likely, a wild animal. And they kept bouncing against his spine and ribs, up and down, up and down. Any attempt to move from his prone position brought pain, as sharp claws dug into his skin and fingers curled around his bicep. Daddy, 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 get up, get up, get up. Claws off the comforter, he growled at the animal. You know that. He felt the sharp points at the back of his thighs relent, replaced by bony knees. But the bouncing wouldn't cease and neither did the prying fingers at his arms. He tried his best to ignore the disturbance, burying his face deeper under his pillow, putting it tight around his head. But that had been a mistake. It gave the beast something to attack, a weakness to exploit. She began prying at his fingers and pulling at the pillow, all while still bouncing up and down on his back, trying to beat the life out of him. Daddy, daddy, stop playing. It's time to get up. Beast pressed her face to his jaw, prying his pillow up just enough to expose one of his eyes. She whispered, I, I have a surprise for you. He grunted. Based on the smell alone, he could guess what it was. This would call for drastic measure. He reached slowly to the left, hand sliding carefully between the sheets so as to not arouse suspicion. He would wake the beast's mother, making contact with the warm body. He shook the creature. She grunted back, no. He pleaded with the mother of the beast, babe, no, sleep, your daughter. The die had been cast. He would make one last attempt to defeat the beast before all was lost. He rolled over towards the mother of the beast. Whee! Sarah landed with a flump on top of her mother. It had worked. The battle was over. Stephen would return to his life of peace that he'd built for himself since last night in this, his king-sized bed kingdom. Ah, uh, Fluffy Bear, your daughter wanted you. I think I heard her say that she was a surprise. Probably she didn't forget what day it was, said the mother of the beast, his wife. Deftly, Aranus yanked his only protection, his pillow from his head. She grabbed his beard and turned him to face her drawing a long lick across his lips before tearing the blankets off of him. All hope was lost. Of course I didn't forget that it is our ten-year anniversary, he said, returning the lick with a kiss. He had gotten her a golden Irentian pearl necklace, which he would surprise her with at dinner that evening. He pushed himself to a seated position in the bed, his back against the headboard, with Aranus doing the same have you got to bring your father a surprise, said his wife. Get your brother. I think he has one for me. But mom, he can't see in the dark, complained Sarah. Neither can I, said Stephen. Go get your sunglasses, then turn on the lights so the men of the house can see what's going on. It won't be much of a surprise if I can't see it, right? Hein, the little girl huffed. When she had cleared the room, Stephen turned to Aranus. You had something to do with this, uh, didn't you? Maybe I did, my fluffy bear, she said as coyly as she could manage. She must have been watching a lot of vids. She was getting better. The kids wanted to do something for us this year. You always tell them that damn story of how you, me, and Aunt Ginter all met. Can you blame them for getting excited? No, but does that have to be so early in the morning? He asked just as the lights came on. Though it took him a moment to adjust to the light, he noticed Arina sporting a pair of reflective gold-hued aviators that she'd kept in the nightstand. Well, that depends on the surprise, she replied cryptically. Some surprises are best enjoyed in the morning. She nodded to the doorway of their bedroom. There stood a young boy not more than eight years of age, a pale skin and dark hair, just like his father. And like his mother, his eyes did not glow at night but instead appeared as green as grass. Hey, kiddo, what you got for me? Stephen asked. Hey, father, th this is for the lady of the manor. 
They hid with the boy, carrying what looked like a pile of raw steaks from six different animals and as many worlds. He presented the tray to his mother. After she took it onto her lap, she pulled him close and kissed him on the cheek and ruffled his hair. Thank you, Agonon, the boy's mother said. Such a dignified young gentleman you are. The boy bowed, looking very proud of himself. Dad! Stephen turned to the sound, just as a miniature night beast wearing lime green shorts, a loose rainbow-covered hoodie, and a hot pink sunglasses bounded through the bedroom door, claws scrabbling all over the hardwood, digging in just long enough to give the good launch for a pounce onto a father. Long black hair, though tied into a ponytail, bound its way into his face. Something hard and warm was forced into his chest. One more thing, said Sarah, excitedly hurrying off her father, her claws still managing to find his calves and the comforter in the process. No peeking, she called back. Stephen shook his head and looked down at what she'd presented him. It was a large plastic cutting board from the kitchen with a metal serving tray cover covering most of it. Something warm was underneath. He reached to lift it. No peeking, my gentleman, said Aranus. The lady says no peeking, sir, echoed Agonon. He stuck his tongue out at his son. The boy stuck his own tongue back at him and jammed an index fingers in both of his nostrils for good measure. Even was about to tell him how he might accidentally stab his brains that way when his daughter tried to kill him for what must have been the third time that morning. Ow! You're getting big, honey, he said, rubbing the girl's back. No, you're getting small, she replied, tossing bottles of chocolate syrup, honey, strawberry syrup, and maple syrup into his lap. Thanks, kiddo, he said. Now, um, what's the surprise? She lifted the cover off the cutting board. Pancakes. The End Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Mezic, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.